James, welcome to the Psychology Podcast. So happy to have you today. How are you doing? Hi, hi, Daniel. Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much. I I've been so looking forward to uh, spending this time with you. I know what, uh, there's a couple of times when uh, you and I couldn't make it, so I'm finally here. So thank you. It is an honour. I'm just thinking how it. It's so incredible. There you are in Bali. I'm here in Hampshire in the UK. You know, the technology, how it's made it possible. I'm, I'm grateful for, for that. For people who don't, who give you a little bit of background, James is a psychotherapist and pioneer in my eyes and also author of the award-winning book, How to Overcome the Bully in Your Brain, and as well as many other things that you're involved in. But I found it uh, impossible to encapsulate all your achievements in a single sentence. So I hope that you alleviate me of the responsibility <laughs> of summarizing me and asking me to start this conversation with a very simple question. If people ask you what you do, what do you say to them? Um, I primarily, well, primarily I'm a dad. <laughs> uh, that, that is the, the best job and the toughest job in the world to a little seven-year-old. Um, particularly as a single dad, but, but uh, my, my work is as, as a director of the Hampshire Hypnotherapy and Counseling Center here in the UK. And we have a team of about 15 therapists and we are a, a private practice. So our team are handpicked. You know, we have a lot of people who apply to work for us, but we absolutely pick the best. And I know we've spoken before, um, my, my personal mission over the next five years is to create a, a brand where people can know they're getting the best therapy and the best therapists. Because here in the UK, I'm not, not sure about other countries, it's, it's an unregulated industry. And mm -hmm. the, the unbelievable horror stories that I've heard over the years of people going to um, therapists and in many ways making them worse um you know stories of people going to somebody's house and there, there are kids running around upstairs there's there's cats everywhere not, not there's anything wrong with cats but um uh, particularly if you've got an allergy to them like me um it, it, i just want an experience where the where the, the the client comes and they know they're in safe hands right from the off uh we live we're in lovely offices the whole experience is uh, for, uh, well, I hope, the best it possibly can be. So in other words, somebody phones up with a problem, we know what therapist to put them with that. You know, you you can't be a specialist in everything. I, I personally would never be able to uh, treat uh, like couples counseling or, or, or bereavement or I don't have the experience. But if, if you say you want to stop smoking or perhaps you want to lose weight, uh, or you have anxiety or depression and I want to want to just upscale your life that's my area then uh, you know I'm kind of cooking it cooking out in full gear so to speak um the rest of the time I create programs write books uh, write music as well for our, our practice so it, it is all geared towards offering the absolute best and, and helping our clients achieve the life they want and deserve essentially i hope, I hope that that kind of makes sense oh, of course the other side is I, I build apps as well so uh we, we are kind of famous in the uk for our weight loss programs uh particularly our virtual gastric band so we've got over a million downloads of our apps and it just means we can help people all across the world with our with our programs mm -hmm. yeah it's one of the reasons why I started this podcast was, and maybe this is a good expectation settings for the people who listen to this conversation for the first time, the psychology podcast with me is about putting people in front of my microphone who are world changers in my eyes so that we can hear their stories and learn from their habits, the way they view the world, their achievements, so that we ourselves can do our part in following their footsteps. And to me, it's it's absolutely amazing that your therapeutic footprint has scaled to the size it, it did. And I feel it's, you spoken of technology earlier in our conversation. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. If you feel like you are not really connected in a way to the people you help, because it's just another number in the downloads of, of your app, but that's another person's life that you touched and ennobled to a degree. And that is inspiring for me. And I hope that over this conversation, we all can 
learn a little bit of how we can reach uh, such greatness for ourselves. But maybe before we go there, what was the first moment for you where you felt like, okay, or the first sign that you will become a therapist or somebody who would be interested in psychology? Um, on, a, on a story, I, um, I, was, I was a school teacher. So I, I taught music in secondary school, uh, had done so for about 12, 12 years or so. And didn't, um, I was concerned where the education system was going. And in many ways, society, I, I kind of almost predicted what would be happening in society now, not that I'm any sort of special intellect or, or but, but how the kids uh, and the children, it was quite, a, it was a, a tough, in a city school, it was a tough school. And I don't believe we were helping the children build their self identity, their self worth. They almost became um, powerless. And that really concerned me. So I, I actually, I got, I got an award from the Queen for my contribution to teaching in, in 2000. And I, I, I kid you not, that day I was at Buckingham Palace. And I thought to myself, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I don't want to be a teacher anymore because actually I don't feel I'm making a difference. And I said to my classroom assistant, who is now my business partner, I said, Let, let's do something that, that has honesty and integrity and, you know, that we can change the world. And I, I'd already, already had a background and an interest in psychology. I said, I'm fascinated by hypnosis and therapy. Let's retrain uh, and, you know, goodness, I mean, the technology that was around 20 odd years ago, there, there was there was virtually nothing. Uh, but I said, I want to retrain, I want to do something that, that makes a difference. And 20 years later, hopefully, we've impacted the lives of thousands of people. But it, it's funny how it, it, in an instant, you can make a decision about something. And, and for me, it was that day at Buckingham Palace. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I just don't want to, you know, I just don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> so you were in the Buckingham Palace talking or like we're getting awarded by the highest yes. member. Of, and yeah. then you thought like, I want to pivot in my life. I've never heard the story like that. That is, that is fascinating. <laughs> what, what do you feel was the precursor to arriving at that uh, conclusion that it's instead of preserving the system that was in place in regards to nourishing the intellects of our youth that you felt i'm going to abandon that particular system and i'm going to do something else because i feel that's yeah. a big sh a big shift in the journey of every entrepreneur where you say either this is beyond fixing or i feel i can contribute something more by disrupting from the outside what was that like for you this is a question make any sense to you uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll answer it uh, in, in the way it's intended. Um, uh, I thought well, it, it's it's great to have that uh, award from the Queen, but I don't feel I've made any made any difference. Uh, you know, it, retrospectively, it's lovely now, twenty years later, and I'm still friends on Facebook with many of the children I taught music to, who now have you know uh, loves and and, and in music and that, but I, I didn't feel like as a teacher, because of the constraints of the, the national curriculum and, you know, I was in a, a, a quite a progressive school. In other words, you had a lot more flexibility perhaps, but I don't feel we were, I think we were teaching kids um, knowledge, but we weren't teaching them to be part of society, to have self-worth. And it, it's almost as if, because it was a tough inner city comprehensive school, those kids would never go beyond almost that glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. So they, they were predestined to, uh, to do professions where, uh, and, and, and you know, that, that perhaps they weren't reaching their potential. You know, I, I could tell when a kid comes in, when a student comes in, which one's gonna be the, the doctor, the lawyer, and, and make a difference because of, of how they were. And, and in fact, there was one, there was one student I, I thought of who I think of quite frequently. And 
he he was from a, a a family that had a lot of problems and I and but had a love of music and writing music and, and composing is kind of my thing. And I remember uh, kind of beg stealing and borrowing for him a computer and a keyboard so that he could almost find solace at home to sit and write and, and make music. And and in doing so, uh, he, he then went on to uh, train and be a music teacher. And, and he's a music teacher somewhere in the country, a Coventry way, I think, something like that. And had I not done that, that kid would never have had that path. But that, that's one, one child. And it, and it wasn't for me about making lots of music teachers or people, who, you know, as long as I um, managed to kind of propagate a love of music, I, I felt I was kind of doing my job. But actually, as the education system, it was almost like this, this pass or fail. And you, you kids, because of where you are, you're never going to achieve anything. You know, just accept you're going to work in the local supermarket or the, um, the, the local shop or something like that. And I thought, well, why why are we... And back then, I used to play um, audio to them from, like, Brian Tracy. During my kind of tutor time, Brian Tracy and, and um, you know, the big speakers, Jim Rohn and Tony Robbins at the time. I remember kind of not getting in trouble with other members of staff, but, like, well, why are you playing this to the, these kids? And I thought, I've got to get out and... and you do something different. Does that make some sense? Has that kind of answered your question to some extent? It's beautiful. It's it's a beautiful notion that that um, reminds me of why we are friends and why you're a mentor of mine. It's like one of my favorite quotes is like a friend is another self, and it's one of my earliest memories that I think kickstarted my my journey. It's before we talk more about the epoch in your life where you were a teacher. Was I remember getting kicked out from my third school. And after that point is because I was a troublemaker. I'm an entrepreneur. I don't like rules and sitting down and not having a say in my own education. But I remember that the teacher who kicked me out said, like, you should start doing something with your hand with your hands, because that head of yours isn't good for anything. And I, I remember that this was a story that was given to me in regards to the limitations of what I could try. And what follows was many years of where I acted in congruence with that particular belief system of like, okay, if if becoming successful is not something that is in the stars for me, I might as well just chase after girls, get in trouble and get drunk all the time in a way. And that was retrospectively one of the things where I really thought like, oh, geez, it's the belief systems we, or the expectations we have for the children we interact with are precursors to how they, what they will become and how far they will go. And it was like, yeah. it's, it was a fascinating experience for me to retrospectively look back and say how important it is like, what our teachers think of us and what what they believe it's, in it's the pygmalion effect isn't it it, it it's is the pygmalion effect yeah, yeah it's 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 so interesting what is the student do you have a favorite story where a student taught you something about life from that time where you were a teacher um there, there is uh, there, there's a particular student i i write about in my book and um I, and I, I remember the day, um, well, I, if the thing is with memory, I think I remember the day, but of course we know that sometimes <laughs> how we remember things is different. But uh, once, uh, every uh, six months, I would bring a large drum kit into the music room and every, every pupil, I would let them have a go at it. And I, I would teach them a, a very basic kind of, you know, I'm not, I'm not a drummer, so it was never going to be that advanced a little basic drum um, rhythm. And most of the kids were like, oh yeah, great, I'll, I'll have a go. They'd, they'd sit down and, and they would be okay. And I remember this one kid, this one pupil, and I can still picture him now. And he would not just, I, I'm not gonna do it. And you have then the, the other children going, uh, firstly, they would encourage him. But then they'll go, well, it's not fair I had to play and, and that, that extreme. So eventually, after lots of lots and lots of um, coaching and consoling, I convinced him to get on the drums. And he was immediately, or, or, or he, you know, as kids do, they're kind of like, oh, no, I can't do it. And I said, no, no, just, just stick at it, try again. And he got on the drums. And immediately I could tell this kid had some rhythmic talent and skill. 
And from that moment onwards, he then had an interest. And I, as I was writing my book, I remembered that. And I think I then got him lessons at school. And I thought, I'm going to try to remember his name and find him on Facebook. And, you know, it's like you, you've taught thousands and thousands of kids. You know, oh. And then suddenly the subconscious went, oh, yeah, I remember his name. And I, I went to, and his, and his profile on Facebook was him playing the drums in his band, you know, the banner at the top. And I thought, yes, job done. You know, he, he's, he, that one minute, two minutes of time, completely transformed his life mm. and i just wonder how how often in people's lives and uh, and you said yourself dan a lovely story of the teacher who said uh you know you'll never be any good at that. how it can you know transform in a minute so can i put the question back to you what what was your pivotal moment in your life where everything changed can you pinpoint a particular moment um that is a good question and it's uh I, I feel we all have many pivotal points and that we all have many different stories that is in our life book in a way. So there were a couple of couple of moments, but one story that followed after I got kicked out for the third time for school was that um, I have amazing parents. And I remember that after I got kicked off from school, they did not abandon their belief in me. They, they fought like lions. I mean, I still remember. Yeah my father and my mother in particular like we grew up with very limited resources and they scrambled up together the funds to put me in a private school and um where wow, okay. I, I had my own curriculum in a way it was a school that was for people for, for adults actually it was for people who wanted to get their high school diploma in their 30s or 40s or sometimes even 50s and that was the only availability for me to like get my degree so i can uh, get the high school diploma so I can go to university and I just remember that having my father and my mother uh, go above and beyond in order to put me in the place where I can continue my journey where I think that was important to me having people not give up on me and in that regard and I was yeah. incredibly incredibly unhappy because I lost all my friends because I got I wasn't with them in school anymore and I was like with these old like, for me it was like I, I still was a cocky kid i was like i'm i was like i'm i'm smart i knew <laughs> I, I knew that to some degree so i like hanging out with the losers so to say i was miserable over the one year but it's it gave me for the first time to a break of six months where i could study what i wanted and in that in that time i remember i just got very mad at at everybody and i just focused on studying psychology and that was the first time where i didn't follow had to follow curriculum i can just I just devoured all the books of Rogers and Skinner and Frankel within like no time, just because I, I could do whatever I wanted to. So that's for me, like, I think like I, I owe a lot of uh, my success to my parents, but I would like to had a question in mind that you stole from me in your politeness Sorry. of <laughs> deflecting the question back to me. If you would go back and talk to the, to the queen and she rewards you with another form of education. And you start a sentence with, how do you address the queen? Um, I'm, I'm not very good with manners, as you, as you noticed probably over the last conversations that, that we had, because <laughs> I'm a, I got kicked <laughs> off from school, right? So I missed that part. But it's like, if you, how would you address her? And then it's like, if you would continue the sentence, this is what's wrong with education, in a way. What would you uh, convey to her in regards to your own experiences and your notions as a experts in the human condition my my memory of that day was firstly how how short and how small she was <laughs> because you you only see the queen on tv you you have no idea of scale yeah and uh, uh you know um that if there's one thought on your mind that's all you tend to think about is and of course, you stumble for words. You, you're not sure what to say, and, and you know you're not sure of the the rituals, etc. I mean, there was a number of teachers there. It certainly, wasn't me on my own. There was a number of teachers on that day. Uh, but to answer your question, what, what I've said to her, I think, and, and I think in many ways, it's it's the focus of my book. One 
I, I think most of the problems that are occurring in the world today, particularly, and I don't know if, if that com comes across where you are in Bali or in, in Germany, is people seem unhappier than ever. There's, there's more um, diversity. Uh, th there's more hate in many ways than ever before. And I, I, I believe the root of this is all down, if you kind of whittle it down, down to self-esteem, mm -hmm. self-worth. Mm -hmm. And I would say, can we, can we build an education system that obviously educates, but actually takes time to build a, a child's self-esteem, self-worth, their self-identity? Um, there's a, you may have seen a brilliant TED talk by, um, uh, is it Ted Robinson, uh, who sadly died out was last year? He, he did a fantastic TED talk about education. Forgive me if I forgot. The surname is definitely Robinson. Um, and he did a fantastic TED talk. And he talks about helping children at the level they're at. Uh, and there's, in, in one example, was, if I remember rightly, a, a young girl who was wanting to dance around the class. But of course, the modern edu education system is about subduing children and, and not al allowing the expression. And he said, well, there, there is a dancer that wants to come out and, you know, um, I, th I think we need an overhaul of the education system because actually children are coming out, they're, they're, there's more depression, anxiety than ever and more unhappiness. Certainly, certainly that, that's what it may, you know, the data may say otherwise, but, let let's build a child's self identity, self worth, and that that's almost a, you know taking Maslow's hierarchy. That's more important than the education, because if you have if you have a belief system of I can do, I can, I can achieve, then you will learn. I mean, edu education for me. I went to university, wasn't about what I learned at the university. It was about learning to learn. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who's dyslexic. I, I've got a I've got a massive love of books. I don't read that many. I listen to lots, but I love buying them. I've got a massive bookcase, and, and I get a buzz out buying them. But actually, I kind of I read very few um, because I I wasn't taught to read particularly well. Probably not not the best grammar there, but I I, I wish I had learned, learned the skills to read better myself when I was growing, you know, when I was at school, but the education system has let so many children down. And I don't know if it's the same in Germany or, or I don't know if that's something you identify with. I, com I completely, com my observations concur with yours. And I think it would be even a step further. You, you called it self-worth and confidence. I feel that something, we've lost something down the lines in regards to to love in regards like right now i feel it's the education systems really come out of them and you you don't believe success is possible for you you instead of yeah like yeah. preserve preserving a young human being with the ideas like the wall is yours like there's talent in you like if you put your nose down and work as hard as you can there's hardly anything these days that isn't achievable with the kind of technologies that our former generations left for us in the form of tools and i remember when i was a stu student i was i was uh, i had the number 3629 and there were 300 people in the class and it wasn't important if i was there or not and i never had anybody when i was in university take me aside and teach me just how powerful of a human being i might become if i take it seriously there it was more like i was in an industrial factory in which i was programmed to do a certain job so that the system works and i feel this is something that yeah. that former societies still had in place where there was a focus on character a focus on responsibility and also a focus in regards to being pro-human in a way i just i feel yeah. like it's 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 these schools and universities teach a victim mentality from what i can see is is you don't even have to try and we are already fucked and it's the environment and, and everything. And I think it's it's based on on the loss of the yeah. the fruits of education of our ancestors. If that make any sense to me. Yeah, it's learned learned helplessness. 
you know, um, the, in many ways, the reason I, I wrote my book, which is, in essence is about belief systems. So, yeah. you know, I, I, could, I could be at a toy shop with my son, uh, which, which as a seven-year-old, I often am. Um, and, and I can tell you, listening to the other parents, talking to their children, what sort of belief systems those kids are going to grow up with. And, and and certainly, particularly in that, that instance, you know, um, belief systems say around money. And it, it isn't just in toy shops, but it, it, that's, I guess it's one where kids are there and, and, and adults are there and their parents are often vocal, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. Oh, you don't deserve that. Likes of us can't afford that. Oh, you haven't been good and, and stuff like that. And, and And the way I see belief systems is we, we are born virtually with, an empty palette, you know, as we know, a fear of falling, a fear of loud noises, but otherwise, no other beliefs. And I liken it to when you go to the the optometrist, and you know, you have those heavy metal glasses they've got on, and they slot the the different frames in. They go, can yeah. you can you read that X Y Z over them? I I see belief systems like that, that you are born, and your 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 parents, your caregivers, your aunts, uncles, friends, to some extent teachers, coaches, they're all slotting different things in. So so your original kind of clear vision has a belief system slotted in. And that belief system might be around self-worth, self-identity. Um, you know, it might be your socioeconomic group. Well, that that's as far as we can go. That that's don't expect, you know, don't don't set your your dreams too high. So by the time we get to uh kind of seven, I would say uh, I think it was Aristotle once said, show me the child up to seven and I'll show you the man. Most of our belief systems are formed. And then from seven to kind of 14, 15, if you were the next level, but the, those, those kind of primary foundations of our belief systems that, that can either support us and allow us to grow or they can limit us. And in many ways, the work I do now as a psychotherapist uh, and as a hypnotherapist are undoing those belief systems. And of course, belief systems are very difficult to undo because you have to be aware that they're a belief system. Yeah. You know, when a, when a client comes in to our practice, we've kind of got two flights of stairs and we don't take the left, we always walk. The, the, the conversation I have with my, my lovely client by the time I've got to the second floor with them, I will have a good idea about why they are there. Not, not based on what, what they've phoned up for, for help with, what they say. So, for, so for, does that make sense? 100%, so, 100%, yeah. Tell me more. Um, I, I might, say, might say to them, oh, you know, how are you today? And a, a very classic English response is, oh, not bad, not bad. And, and I actually dedicate uh, quite a, I actually wrote a whole chapter in my book on that phrase, not bad, but then because of space, I reduced it down into one, one kind of a paragraph, a couple of paragraphs. Um, how are you? I'm oh, not bad. I hope your journey was okay. Oh, the traffic was a nightmare. Just my luck. Typical, isn't it? Uh, I knew that would happen. So, so I can determine whether they are a catastrophizer further language, whether they buy into magical, mystical beliefs. In other words, if they say, oh, I knew it was going to be that luck today, just just my luck. Uh, whether they have a negative um, disposition in, in their belief systems, whether their internal language is negative, um, and whether they, well, I, I, the last chapter of my book, I, I, I quote from Einstein when I uh, say, what he said was the most important question. Do you see the universe as friendly or hostile? Mm. The majority of the clients we see would see the universe as hostile. Yeah. And um, the work that, that I do, our team do, are all about challenging those things, the, 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 the thoughts, the belief systems, the internal dialogue, and in, in shifting your belief systems that's when true change comes. Somebody, somebody said to me recently, what, what's the difference between my book and, say, cognitive behavior therapy, CBT? And I, I, it got me for it. I thought about it. And I said, that's a great question. 
my book is what you should read before you do CBT. Because how can you change your belief systems unless you a know you have belief systems, yeah. know that they might possibly be skewed and distorted? Um, how, how can you bring about any change? If, if, if that's the way you think and everything you do supports that constantly, if you, if you look for that, uh, as um, uh, the brilliant quote, um, I forget the name, but um, uh, it will come to me. I'll see it when I believe it. Mm. I'll see it when I believe it. Mm -hmm. In other yeah. words, you will look for everything to support what you already believe. Mm -hmm. so, so helping a client change their, their negative thinking style, their catastrophic thinking, and that, that could be a huge um, game changer for a lot of clients. That, that black and white, um, all or nothing thinking, that learned helplessness, and, and, and most importantly, what, what uh, you wouldn't understand as a locus of control, mm -hmm. how, how in control they can feel. And, and something you and I have spoken about before, something that would come much later in therapy is, is that um, based on the brilliant Viktor Frankl and, and Man's Search for Meaning, I think both you and I are, uh, I, I universally recognize as believing that's one of the greatest books ever written. Um, that logotherapy, that meaning, what meaning do you have in your life? Because I, I don't yeah. believe that depression and anxiety, or well, certainly depression, could coexist with a big enough meaning in your life. Yeah. And it's not yeah. just somebody says that to you. Can you actually begin on that journey? So our clients are on a journey. And again the reason i wrote my book is to is to get them to that journey quicker and you know we're all on that path and we're all we are all myself included have to constantly challenge our belief systems what, what is this how the world is you know the fact that we all see the world differently you know you and i are very aligned and i knew that from the moment i spoke to you dan but we will see the world slightly differently but it, mm -hmm. but but there would be like a crossover does that make sense it com completely makes 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 sense james and it's um i my co-founder he's not working with me anymore a shout out to you pavel i miss you come back to the company <laughs> he's he used to wear a black a black hoodie when he was building the behavior uh university and on the back of the hoodie yeah. was don't believe everything you think and he wore that 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 hoodie I'm not sure you ever watched it, Paolo, but that's the story for another time. But he wore that thing every day. And I, and now that I'm thinking back of it, that's such a beautiful notion. And one of the things that instigated yeah. my interest to start this podcast, because I was so fascinated by working with clients, by reading literature of when I was studying psychology of depressed people, where it's like, you don't know what you don't know. And it's it's very difficult to to notice belief systems that are holding you down. And it's it's even though we are aligned to some degree, you're much further ahead the journey than I am. And I hope that I can reverse sure. engineer some of the the belief systems, the, the architecture of my mind to the degree I become more successful by putting myself in a room with people who are oriented properly in a, in, in a way. And I think this is where questions do a great job. You spoke of Frank. Well, when, when you find somebody like that, can you let me know? <laughs> 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 I play playing the fool comes always always handy and doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's in that regard, it's like I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's like one of my favorite stories from Franco. There's actually a, a free tool on the behavior university. I think it's called um is it called the lecture? No, it's called the the Frankel tease. I love I love that. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, I yeah. Yeah, it's that. it's one of my favorite stories from Frankel. He was a Jewish therapist who got deported to Auschwitz for people who don't know. And he spent his time in the camps investigating who survives under the hardest conditions possible and who yeah. um, vanishes in a way. And sometimes when he saw people there falling to despairs and running into the fences in order to get shot pretty much by the Nazis. It was their form of suicide. He would often approach them. And there's one story that always comes to my mind that I found fascinating in regards to the uh, power of questions where he told Frankel, I have nothing to expect out of life anymore. And Frankel took him aside and said, could it not be that life expects something out of you? And in that conversation, he reconnected him to 
responsibilities that he had abdicated in regards to maybe there was someone waiting outside of the camps for him where there was a book he didn't finish like like yours or maybe just life in general he was expecting of him to contribute something while he's still breathing and in that exercise you you write a letter to life pretty much in regards to identify some of your responsibilities and that's really a story yeah. i find so fascinating because you're like how some people take one question and they shatter your mindset and take you on a journey that sometimes takes years and and transforms you into a completely different person um so you're spoken of teachers what what was a teacher for you before you became one or who put you on the path like what was like one of the earliest programmers who are like, who set you up for success who you owe a bigger depth of, of gratitude than others um i i would say uh, well personally i didn't have a very good education here in the uk and uh i would have been classed as in the kind of the special remedial groups and going back to what we we're saying about the pygmalion effect I Could you elaborate briefly what the Pygmalion effect is not for it. For, I know a lot of psychologists so, yeah, sure. psychologists listening but uh, <laughs> for, for other people as well. So so if certainly back uh, when I was in school in the 1970s if you are seen as you weren't bright, weren't intelligent, you were but in a, a special group in the classroom and you weren't expected to be much and, and the essentially the Pygmalion effect uh was an experiment and, and forgive me for I can't remember the, the who, uh, who carried out the experiment where psychologists went into a classroom and they said right they said to the teacher those teachers every every pupil has been tested and those pupils are doing particularly well in the test you should keep an eye out for them and that they showed kind of high standards of uh, learning etc and what happened was when the psychologist returned several months and i believe years later that the the pupils that had been highlighted as doing well did really well but what they didn't let the teachers know was actually there was no data they just randomly picked the kids in other words it was belief systems and um expectations again i hope i described that experiment well um but um I, I I even briefly, as it sounds crazy, think about now. I actually briefly considered suing the education authority many years later after I got my degree because of the poor standard of education here in the UK. And I think um, obviously it, it became impossible to to prove. Uh, but I hope things have moved along on a lot further. And in many ways, I've taught myself. I, I went on to, let's say, get a degree, but the the inability to read very well, being slightly dyslexic, and and um, not allowing those limitations. I mean, the fact that I, being dyslexic, I went on to write a book is, and I and I remember when it was it was actually a mentor of mine, and I was talking to him about an idea, and he said, "Well, uh, you should write a book back." And I remember thinking immediately, "I couldn't write a book. It's like uh, the, do you mind you know, mentioning I, him? Trouble enough reading." Yeah, no, Jeff Baker, Jeff. I remember the day very clearly. And I remember thinking, well, how can I, how can I write a, a book about belief systems and not um, overcome that belief myself that I can't do something? Mm. That, that would be, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to him for that. He, he writes a forward in my book as well. So you've got to challenge your beliefs all the time. So, so go, I think I, I've gone off from the question. I, I, the one teacher I think of about the only one was a, a Mr. Salmon, who he this is in primary school. He would go off the grid, and I remember taking here taking us as a class to a a Roman pottery works in the New Forest to dig up Roman pottery. Now nowadays, sadly, that probably wouldn't be allowed or, or would happen for many reasons. But I remember that day thinking, "Wow, this is Roman pottery," and there was. I remember some of the pottery had thumbprints in it, and I think, wow! And that I think he, my love of history came from that day. So he he wasn't about the national curriculum. He was talking about his interests. He, he was, uh, you know, big into history and stuff like that, and, and that came across. And one one teacher can have such an impact on your life. In fact, one experience of one teacher can have such an impact, as we discussed earlier. Yeah. 
It reminds me of Socrates. I think the job of a teacher is not to fill a vessel, but to kindle a flame. And I think that's something that is, yeah. we, all, yeah, yeah, we yeah. also forget. It's like the idea of like a, a bad teacher is somebody who programs a child, but rather sparks a passion for education in general. I love that. Yeah. 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 Rem reminds me of my teacher. My teacher, my, my, my sister, when she taught me reading, my first book that I read was the Harry Potter series. Big ass books there, thick like that. For wow. those people who haven't read it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. She, yeah. She always always pulled a trick on me. Like she started reading it to me. I was a child, and it's just when it was about to get exciting, she pretended to fall asleep. And, like, <laughs> and then I was like, hey, I was trying to wake her. I was like, come on, man. It's like something's happening here. And then I took the book and just, ah, oh, fuck it. I've got to do this myself. And this is how she made me fall in love with reading. And it's like, I owe her so much for this in a way. All the books I've written wouldn't exist without it. So I think yeah. that's a good example. Well, um, biggest lesson you learned from your parents, if I may ask. Um, my my mum was very negative. I'm mean, she was one, both my parents are wonderful. They both passed away now. My mum was very negative and it wasn't until later in life that I realized that and actually used it in a way to um, not be like that. So, so in other words, my dad was very, very positive and the, the loveliest, kindest man, as was my mum. But he had the, yeah, you can achieve anything you want attitude, whereas my mum was, oh, don't bother, wasted time. And I think ha having those kind of different balances, you realize whose belief system you want to follow and whose you want to protect yourself from. And I, I began also to realize the power of words and what what words can have an impact. And um, a as a parent now, I am I am so hyper vigilant to the belief systems I'm imparting on my son. Um, but but recently. Uh, Rich and I did this this experiment. Um, he done, he done a bad day at school. He, he, obviously, he's only seven, and you know, kids kids can be horrible. Uh, he had, he came in from school a bit upset. I picked him up, and it became apparent that somebody had been saying nasty words to lots of other kids, and, and you know. And I saw this experiment online, and I don't know if you've seen this um, with with two rice jars. So I got two brand new rice jars, and. Uh, I washed them in the, in the, uh, the dishwasher, so they're both exactly the same. Um, so it's two glass jars and one bag of rice, boiled the rice, and I divided the rice up into the two jars. And I said to my son, I said, uh, I want you to write a label. I gave him some labels. One that said hate on and one said love. And I stuck them onto these jars and put them on the staircase. So as we got the stairs in the house, we... We say nice words to one and horrible words to the other. You know, like, you're incredible, you're wonderful, I love you. As opposed to, I hate you, you're worthless, you're ugly, etc. And I saw this uh, online, and I'll be honest, I thought, this is not this is mumbo jumbo, this isn't going to work. And I began thinking, what am I going to do if there's no change after a couple of weeks? Because I really want to learn the lesson, I want to say the power of words. I didn't need to do anything. And it still blows my mind how different the two jars are. And I've, I've actually brought them down with me to show you today. I'm not a believer in fate, luck, and chance or anything like that, but, but I, I want to replicate this experiment. So let me see it. And that's the, the love jar. That's the hate jar. Mm. Together. And that comes it. across. Yeah, I love that. And it's that it's blown my mind. And it's yeah. it's I, I want to recreate it again because I, I, I cannot believe the difference. Yeah. But but it says to me how important our words are. And and yeah. sometimes, Dan, I know you you know you, you know something and you try and follow it, but it's not till you are reminded of something like that do you think, wow, wow. And and, and I think of the internal dialogue that we all have yeah. constantly running yeah. how much of that is positive how much is negative and i would wager a bet that the majority of the the lovely clients we see have 
internal dialogue that that is self-destructive um and, and it reminded me have you, have you ever come across or read david snowden's brilliant book the the nun study not yet aging with grace i will send you a link to it so okay. uh, in, in the nun study and, and, and i talk about it briefly in my book um and, and forgive me if i quote any of this wrong but david snowden and his team looked at the text uh, Catholic nuns in, I think it was Massachusetts. So, that, so, so when a nun joined the convent, she was asked to write a certain page of text. Now, and they chose nuns because, in theory, they had a similar background. So they were very, very unlikely to smoke and drink. But uh, who knows? With you know, um, they would have had similar kind of values. That diet would have been the same. So, so as best you can, the, the the study was controlled and the nuns when they joined the convent were asked to write about themselves about their faith about their hopes for the future in, in a several page document and uh Stoughton and his team got those documents I, I believe they're from the 1930s and 40s and then they they created an algorithm to see how positive how negative the, the, that, that text was is and and each nun was given a score and then they went to go and find the nuns. And what they found was phenomenal. The nuns that had, had the more positive text, something like 80% of them were still alive. Mm -hmm. The nuns who had been scored with a more negative kind of um, external locus of control uh, text, something like 20% were still alive. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and, and throughout, the, and you know, if you, if you read the book, you see the data. It is so black and white how how our, our, our negative thinking, our locus of control, our belief systems. I mean, obviously, I'm not talking about religious or political beliefs. I'm talking about the belief systems we have, we, we've learned from our parents, our carers, how much they can impact our health and longevity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And it's... I know we've spoken before. You know what 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 experience have you got with with kind of that internal dialogue Dan? first thank you so much for for sharing this experience this struck really a chord with me and while you talked it there came an old story of my mind of, of a teacher who taught me the the importance of controlling my thoughts uh, i was a patient in a psychiatry to get my life back together it was i think six years ago or something and there was this I think she was one of the ugliest girls I ever met in my life. <laughs> she was very short, very hairy, very thick, but a wonderful soul. Shout out to you, Samira. We're still friends to this point. And she kind of showed me around. To, 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 <laughs> what? To, well, you were friends. <laughs> until this podcast. Ah, she knows. We talk like this with each other. We have a strange love and hate relationship in a way. But she took me aside and showed me the rounds. And she smoked like, I don't know, man, three packs of cigarettes a day. And there was outside of the psychiatry was this little pavilion where all the people came, the patients to smoke. That was the bonding ritual there. And we talked about life. And there was something, there was this one girl, she started talking like, you know, my, it happened again. Like love didn't work out for me. Just There's just no one compatible on the world for me. It's, it's just the same thing. I wonder if I should keep trying. And she did something that was very interesting. And she made a sound like, and, and, um, I later learned that they were in a borderline program where they learned a habit of making a loud sound whenever they heard disempowering thoughts. And I okay. remember that that she always did that. And one of the, she left like after two weeks, one of the gifts she gave me because it's, I had a problem with guilt when I was there. I was very unhappy with who I was and I was uh, punishing myself for not being as successful as I would like to be. And she gave me this little clicker to measure the amounts of times during a day where I would say something that is in me. And the sound of it was a little bit like a gun that was being loaded. And I think that story taught me a little bit in regards to that our mind is like a gun. And if we aim it yeah. ourselves, like we end up like Swiss cheese and blow ourselves out of ex existence. And that's one of the stories that came to mind. It's just like, if you think about how many, we have thousands of thoughts per hour. Yeah. And if we use all of them to hurt ourselves like intellectually or verbally it's it's only a matter of time but there's nothing left and we are pushed to the extremes if that make any any sense and 
Yeah, absolutely. 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. James, happy you're back. <laughs> Glad to be back. I hope everybody enjoyed the commercial from the Behavior University, which I'm going to edit in afterwards because no, right now we don't have any sponsors yet. So I'm my own sponsor in this regard. Okay. Um, we talked in our last segments about the importance of cognition, of the things we think, but also about the importance of our caretakers and how difficult it is to escape uh, the early programmers from our childhood. And I wanted to ask you, James, what advice you have for people who are, who grew up with horrible parents in a way, what is something you would yeah. say to them and something where they can escape the trajectory that was set for them on an early stage? I would say, first of all, be grateful because it's, you know, um, as Thoreau, uh, Henry Thoreau said, you know, most people live lives of quiet desperation. But I think if if you come from adversity and you meet the right mentor, the right person, you can go on to do extraordinary things and change the world. And um, to take it to the other extreme, you know, I remember reading recently that something that, that I was quite surprised about, that Olympic gold medalists, 100% of Olympic gold medalists had some form of childhood trauma. Yeah. And, and that that's what's motivated them. I mean, the rest of us don't have to go to kind of that, that level of passion because actually, are they that happy? Um, you know, and once you've got your gold medal, what do you do next year? But, but, but understand and recognize that adversity can be the springboard to live an extraordinary life. And in many ways, the, the clients we see have have mostly come from some adversity some hardship but actually they are using that to to be an outlier to live in a, to live an extraordinary life so firstly be grateful be aware of the belief systems of your parents now i call this the alfred method so in my book, there's a there's a chapter on what I call this Alfred method. So, um, in in Batman folklore, uh, and I guess this was inspired my, by my son, who's a big Batman fan. In, in if you've ever seen Batman, you know he has his butler Alfred, and Alfred will do anything for Batman, and you know he he loves him, cares for him, and he gives him not what he wants, but what he needs. So why, why I call it the Alfred method, method is, which stands for always look for redundant beliefs, Alfred, is think of your, your, you have with you all the time almost on your shoulder, is this kind of butler. Um, and, and if you look at the kind of the, 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 the story of Batman, but, but, um, Alfred was like a, an ex SAS, he was a medic, you know, a real, and, and, and Gujitsu, uh, Gujitsu, that's a toy, isn't it? Jujitsu. <laughs> um, so, so have that kind of little figure questioning your thoughts all the time. So mm -hmm. you always look for redundant beliefs. Is this belief real? Is, is this based on any reality? Is it just something I've learned from my parents? Am I, what am I doing to support this belief? Is it, is it helping me, empowering me, or is it limiting me? And, and, you know, am I, am I living under that, that glass ceiling? And in fact, an, an, an analogy I came up with recently with clients is, imagine you are in this house, you're in a nice room in this posh house, a nice mansion. You're in one room, it's a nice room. It's got a TV, it's got a view out the window, but, and it's well furnished, but it's a, quite a small room. Imagine if you turn the door, went into the corridor and you suddenly realize there's lots of other rooms. There's a, 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 a big staircase. There's a massive dining room, a big lounge, and outside is a, a massive garden. You have all those things. You have that house. But most of us live in that one room. And it, it is our belief systems that keep us in that one room. So in many ways, the work we do with clients and in my book, it's about turning that handle 
challenging your beliefs and going out into that corridor and actually noticing there is a, a big, beautiful mansion out there that you can live in. Whereas most of us choose to live in the one room. And, and you know, I, I think about often um, the book, um, uh, Brave New World, Aldous Huxley's book, and he talks about Soma, the, the drug Soma, which is freely available. And, and in many ways, Soma are our mobile phones. Soma are the, the hours and hours we sit and watch TV for. It's, it's that, that limitation that we put on us. You know, we are happy enough just to be too addicted to our mobile device, just to live, live within that one room in our mind. Does it make some sort of sense? It makes amazing to I think that's one of the most uh, interesting questions I ever heard is to ask yourself is if my childhood from a metaphorical standpoint like in what room did i got stuck in in the way it's like my yeah. follow-up question for you would be if you could talk to batman pretty much would you get him out of that room because i <laughs> would what would you what how would you talk to him because it's oh. i've i've discovered something tremendous tremendously useful about the idea of the possessed broken man in a way like the most successful individuals that I've come across. And it's, um, I don't want to put myself in that category in way by any sense of forms, but what I found is it's the form of say, like a soul injury that happened as, yeah. a, as, a, as yeah, a child yeah. that stays with them forever, but that is overcompensated by an extreme overcompensation and drive that knows no limits and is turns into a form of megalomania where the person oscillates between the two so this becomes like the strange harmony of pushing them farther as other people where they learn to control themselves to the degree where nothing else matters but to reach yeah. the the a point where something like this will never happen again in a way so my question for you would be if you would be in a room with batman is would you change him or would you sacrifice him for the for the benefit of gotham <laughs> that's, gosh that's a that's such a great question maybe i should uh, ask my son that he, he knows a lot more about batman than, than i do um oh, but maybe gosh, you maybe maybe maybe, maybe 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 you heard the intention <laughs> of it in a way you know what i mean it's, it's in regard like if you for example we find elon, elon or somebody who is uh yeah an extreme character and there's something I don't know. They, it's not just that they, they, they work, but they are possessed in a way. And we as a society worship these individuals. And one of the yeah, reasons yeah, yeah. why at some point I, I stopped doing therapy because I kind of, I don't know, I, I, I kind of integrated that into my form of success in a way where I patted myself on the shoulder and found peace with it. And I wonder, like, what's your take on it in a way? Particularly you also as a father, you have an interesting perspective on it. Yeah, I, I think though those people seldom find peace in their mind and, uh, you know, things are never quite good enough. And but it, but equally, that's what drives those individuals, you know, the Elon Musk, the Steve Jobs, etc. Um, so it's a balancing act between finding peace and, and finding happiness and living an extraordinary life where, where you are changing changing your world so it's a, it's a really great question and it's something I'd, I'd, I'd like to give a lot more th thought to so thank you for it um but, but going back to what you were saying about if you've got a parents that perhaps were abusive etc you know it, I, i'm going to tell you another true story that happened recently if that's if you don't mind Please, and it please, was a, a a lovely client of mine. Uh, um, his mom was an alcoholic. Uh, so dad dad had so, uh, sadly passed away, and um, this this lovely gentleman was a really really nice guy, and never felt good enough, and never felt happy. And he he said to me because uh, I I actually kind of became friends with him after therapy, which which. It does occasionally happen. I mean, you leave a certain amount of period after therapy and if people reach out to you, et cetera. And 
I meet up with him and, and, and another friend at a similar time. And he said something incredible happened. He was uh, driving his mum up to uh, a couple of hours away in the car to a place uh, for something. And he just sat with his mum in the car and he actually had a copy of my book that, uh, and I, I kind of do mention him in it. He said to his mum, look, look at, have a look at this. And he said, I'd never been truly happy. And do you know why? And without any blame, he spoke about how her drinking had made him feel over the years. And she listened. And it, again, it was without any judgment or blame. And they came back later in the day. And this is a, a, a quite an old lady. And from that day on, she never has never drunk again. That was six months ago. Mm -hmm. And he'd often say to me, you know, how should I be with my mum? I, I, I feel all this anger, this stuff has come up in therapy, I feel all this anger, and I said, that will pass. And now she is welcomed by the family. She's she's kind of become such a different person. And it and it reminded me about how we can change in an instant when our self-identity changes. And I talk about this in the last chapter of, of my book, this, what I call the self-identity flow. And I use the example of uh, like vegans and vegetarians. If, if you are a vegan or a vegetarian, that is who you are. You don't question it. You, you never come home from the supermarket and you, you've accidentally bought bacon or something. That is who you are. When I became a dad, I've never forgotten I'm a dad. That, that's your self-identity. That is now who you are. You know, you're, uh, I'm, I'm my son's dad rather than my own person. Once you take on the self-identity and that is who you are, then you can change in an instant. And I would imagine that day that that, that gentleman's mother took on a new self-identity from that moment. She, she thought of herself differently. And it's similar to Santa Claus. You know, if when, as a kid, you find out that you discover the truth behind Santa Claus, um, then you never go back. Yeah. You never, you never see a 40 year old man queuing to see Santa Claus at Christmas on his own and see the grotto, you know, because you've changed your self-identity. You change how your belief system, how you see something. And, and a question I often get asked um, is, you know, can, can we change? And there's a brilliant book by uh, Daniel Hardy. Forgive me, I've got it wrong, Dan Hardy. And it's called Personality Isn't Permanent. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that true change comes when we change our belief system and we change our self-identity. And we see a, an awful lot of people come to see us to lose weight. As I said to earlier, one of our, our best-selling apps, it, uh, Virtual Gastric Band, and another one called 12 Weeks to Hours, is, is, is about weight loss. And because we have a Facebook group with, I think it's 35,000 members, we, we have, uh, if you were able to gather a lot of data as to why some people are successful with their weight loss and other people, other people aren't. And, and we support them on that, that journey. And it, it gave me the, if you will, the tools, the, the ability to stand back with a, an overview to see, well, why are some people massively successful in transforming their lives and losing weight and others not so? And two things occurred. One is I would, I would frequently post a quote by Nathaniel Brandon, uh, who's for many the father of self-esteem. And, and, and I, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's pretty much self-esteem, whether a high or low, tends to be the gener of, generator of self-fulfilling prophecies. With high self-esteem, we're more likely to persist in the face of difficulties. With low self-esteem, we're more likely to go through the motions of trying without really giving our best. In other words, if, if somebody doesn't work on their self-esteem, their self-identity, then no matter what they will do, when they are successful, they begin to feel anxious and self-sabotage. And that's, that's when it can all go wrong. But if your self-identity is, in that example, that of a slim, fit, healthy person, that is who you'll become. And that from that moment onwards, you will view everything from that, that filter, that belief system of, is this something a slim, fit, healthy person would eat? Is this something a slim, fit, person, a slim, fit healthy person would, an activity they would do? So, so for me, you can change your self-identity 
in a heartbeat with the right evidence, with the right shift of belief system. And does, does, does that make sense for you? Dan, have you got an experience where, where your self-identity has I changed? Lo perhaps? I love that so much, the notion. It reminds me of the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche who said something. I'm butchering that quote totally, but he said, like, I found myself in, in darkness, but took three steps and made my way to paradise. The first thing was a good thought, yeah. the next a good word, and the next a good deed. And it's something that is helped helped me through my darkest times is the idea that reinvention is always at our like available to us at any any given given moment. And it's like if your life sucks, you can just decide to be a new person and create a new life yeah. for it. It's like that's something where it was very needed in, in my regard. Um, that is so interesting. Yeah. I want to I wanna have your thoughts on an extreme case on reinforced identity in a way. Like I'm a German and I'm not sure I ever talked about this on a podcast. And there's a phenomenon that is, it grabs the attention of psychology for now 70 years. It's, it's the, not, the Nazi time in a way. And one yeah. of the things yeah, yeah. that I thought a lot about was the strange dialectic between Adolf Hitler and the German people in a way where they projected this savior image onto him and where he embraced it and where atrocious things happened as, as a consequence. And I wanted to ask you, what's the strangest case you ever, or maybe just what's your, what's your question, your take of from her as an expert in the human condition on what happened there in, in regards to the belief systems that, that manifested themselves there? Because I feel it's... It, we feel it's a long time ago, but I feel it's something that is still relevant up to this day. It's like there are, there are, we worship people from head of nations still up to this day. I just came from Thailand back, for example, and there are statues of the king everywhere where we bow down yeah. to yeah, yeah. In, individuals or even right now in the United States with, with Donald Trump or something where it's like rather than supporting his ideas, there are like people who worship him and who put him on a pedestal and Think he's a god and other people would think he's a demon in a way and i wanted to have your your take on this extreme form of uh, identity that was the worst question but maybe maybe you can just share your thoughts oh no it's a great question it's a it's a really great question gosh um uh, well for, let, just let's talk about donald trump very, very briefly i was looking at the data recently about donald trump and why his campaign was successful and it appears that um, one of the reasons was because he would advocate things that were in, in most healthy thinking minds would be complete distortions. Uh, um, there was one particular example when he was saying, talking about um, the, uh, uh, was it measles jab or, or one of the jabs that causes autism. Now, that that was originally something thrown about uh, a number of years ago. That, that the, the link between um, having these uh, these jabs in autism in, in in young children, there was no evidence of it. It, it was completely made up. But of course, it's a story, so you know. And he spoke about that, but but uh, the reason he did so well is because he was everywhere. In other words, whoever bombards the media with the most attention will, 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 will win. I'm, I'm a big fan, a big studier of, of body language. And there's, a, there's a, a fantastic example of body language between, um, uh, it was Nixon and uh, Kennedy. And, and this um, was the first televised presidential debate and, and why it's so fascinating is because if you listen to it on the radio, as most people perhaps would have done, Nixon won. But if you watched it, Kennedy won. Mm. Hands down, because of his body language and the way the way he spoke. So so um taking it taking it to Hitler, um I think, in a way, Hitler was at the right time. So timing was everything. I think he was hypnotic in what in how he would speak, and obviously, studying hypnosis for years. Before, I know before he spoke, 
there were long periods of silence. So engaging in the audience, like you're almost drawn into the silence. And if you look at his hand movements, he did, did lots of that. Again, that's hypnotic. That's emphasizing the, the, those certain points. But I think it was a perfect storm of, of the right time. Uh, the tipping point, you're getting enough people believing a lie. They will follow that. And, that, you know, it, it's, I think, it, I, gosh, no, I think it, it, it requires a whole other podcast to uncover that. But I, I think it was a perfect storm of the right time and telling enough lies to enough people. Uh, and you will probably recall who said, was it Goring that said that? Uh, forgive me. Uh, you know, if you tell a big enough lie to enough people, they will believe it often enough. Yeah. I, I forgive me, I can't remember the exact. Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think, said I, that. I, think I, I think he said said something something like that according to those lines. I think I agree. Yeah, and I think right now in the world, um, as I said right back at the beginning, that the world is more divisive than ever. There's more division. More people have such you know different differing views i believe so you know uh, ever certainly in, in my lifetime you know i i i've got to tell you this this story happened at the weekend i'm still thinking about i i said i'm a big fan of books so i took my son into southampton the, the biggest city and we went into a bookshop and i i want him to to, to love books as as i do. and we had a look at the children's books and we went upstairs and there was a book in front of us as we turned the corner I said if um you know when I, when I write my next book maybe I'll get it published and it'll be in this bookshop and we turned the corner and right in front of us was a book and we both stood and looked at it it was face most books are kind of like that. this was facing this way and this book was entitled I hate men mm. And we both stood, and it's by a French author, and we both stood and looked at it. And he asked me, he said, Daddy, uh, you know, with all the work I've done with the, the rice jars and, and the power of words, why has somebody written that book? Yeah. And I'll be honest, I didn't know how to answer. Hmm. How do I, you know, such the, the, the obvious misandry. Part of me wanted to hope it was a book about, a comical book about, you know, uh, ribbing or, to taking the mech out of your partner, but but it clearly isn't. It's it's a book about misandry, and I hate yeah. men. It, it, it's clear as crystal. If I'd written a book entitled "I Hate Women," that would never be published. There'd yeah. be there'd be riots, there'd be protests, um, and yet there it was. So it it does seem. And this is a terrible answer to your question. I realize I've kind of gone off. I but... think no. I think I th I would say tell you in a second why I think it's a beautiful answer. Because it's it's I think what you discovered at the weekend was a manuscript that was born out of resentment of an individual, and my yeah. follow up question would pretty yeah. much because which is a, there's a, we talked about beliefs, I feel there are two different two fundamental stories that govern individuals. It's you said it earlier. It's like do we live in a hostile universe or in a in a friendly universe or in Shakespearean manner to be or not to be. And there are very yeah. many individuals out there who think it's humanity is a mistake and they don't always go to the end of executing that particular belief systems, but sometimes they do. And I feel like when a book like that exists, where you pretty much say, I hate 50% of my species. <laughs> It's it's yeah. what I've discovered is like how a person views the world tells you much more about that person than about the world. And my question would be yeah. for you in this regard: We talked about Hitler, and it's um, do you think it was top to bottom or bottom up? In a way, does that question make sense? Yeah, I think so. That's a, such a great question. Now you're you're, you're, uh, you're such a brilliant. Um, Asker of questions is probably a term for that. Um, Thank you. I, I, I think I would have to say it's top down. Mm. In, other, in other words, you know, going back to what I was saying uh, previously about the, the optometrist putting the different lenses in, if you get enough people at the right time putting the right lenses in, 
you will see the world as that. You know, I, I, I took my son to, uh, hopefully this might get going off the subject again. I took my son to Comic-Con. I don't know if you've ever come across a Comic-Con. Well, I know that it's, it's people like it. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love it. Big business, and it's great fun. You know, the you, Darth Vader, Spider Man, and, and all those of them, and, and Batman. And there was a guy in front of me in the queue, queuing to see a Star Wars exhibit, mm. and he had a T-shirt on, and it said, "Fish aren't real." Or words to that effect. And I, I read it, and I, I thought, have I read this wrong? And and basically, he was saying that the sea doesn't exist. Now, bear in mind that this is in a town called Portsmouth, which is right by the sea. And I, I partly wanted to, to, to ask questions about it. I got home and I Googled this movement, and it's people that believe fish aren't real, they're made up, etc. Um, but it reminded me of something I wrote about in my book, about the Flat Earth Society. So I'm sure you've heard of the Flat Earth Society. So... Uh, they have, they, they have um, millions of members around the globe, ironically. Um, so conspiracy theories such as, or theories such as the Earth is flat. I believe that, if I take that example of the Flat Earth Society, I believe if that you funded a rocket to go up into outer space, to, to view the world far enough so you can see it's a, a, a globe or slightly, it's slightly oval, isn't it, apparently? How many, let's say we took 100 flat earthers and we funded this mission to go up into outer space to view the earth from outer space. Dan, how many flat earthers do you believe would change their belief system about the earth? Confronted with the uh, you know, unequivocal evidence that well, the earth is that, how many do you believe would change their belief system? I would, this is a question that goes beyond beyond my intellect, but it's one of the things I've learned <laughs> learned, learned from Carl Rogers. I thought a lot about, to answer your question, is I thought a lot about how it's possible to change people who don't want to change themselves. It's a, it's one of my role models was my brother, a professional basketball player, and he got, he got ill along the way and separated themselves from, from our family. And I always looked for ways on how to like help from the from a from afar, yeah. even though he didn't want it. And my conclusion was that it's not possible. It's that you focus on those who want help. So my short answer is like what I learned from Roger is that it's one of the therapeutic preconditions for changing belief system is that and the person is actually willing to listen and sits on the table yeah. Yeah, yeah. like voluntarily. Yeah. That's you know, a great makes good, any sense. Great example. Yeah, that's a brilliant example. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, in many ways, we we are fortunate because the the clients that come to us want to be changed um, yeah it's not well it's in, in, sometimes this is not the case it's like well, there's like mandatory therapy as well yeah. and I, I have actually found some good ways in which you can help these people like manipulate these people into changing with, with <laughs> questions where you make their outcomes of their journeys uh, more visible like with your jaw right like if you sit down with people and i've had a lot of experience with malignant narcissists in the past and it's like one of the ways that i found it effective with them is like map out with them what the long-term consequences for them will be if they're going to continue to live a parasitical existence in a way and it's when they could see the jars in a way of the two different lifestyles it's they sometimes became flexible but sometimes this was exactly what they wanted because they wanted to punish themselves anyway yeah. i mean that's uh, <laughs> you know let's do another podcast about narcissism sometime yeah, um, we talked a little bit about, I would, I would love to talk a little bit about the chapter of you helping people as in, in your client private practice, because one of the things that fascinated me is that you've helped so many people. And I feel it's my, one of my mentors, Dr. Jeffrey Cutler, he's out of like 150 therapy books, said like one of the privileges for wow. him of being a therapist is living the lives of a thousand people in a way. And I, I think that's yeah, such yeah. a beautiful notion. And I wanted to ask you, What's like um, the most, maybe you start there, the strangest case you ever counseled? <laughs> gosh. Um, gosh, I will delve in deep here. Um, I, I, will, I will start with a lovely story that happened recently uh, and then I'll delve into that. Um, I so had let's a walk away up. <laughs> yeah, let's work it. Let's start. Let's ease ourselves in. Um, I had a lovely client um uh, about two and a half years ago now, during covid 
because we as a as a private practice we were still open and able to particularly remotely help people uh this um youngish lad with a, a family wife and a couple of kids and he had gone to a hotel room to to commit suicide and i was clearly unfortunately not successful so his wife phoned up and, and I, I saw him several days later and we're not an emergency service but but if somebody uh is in a good position and then then we can work with it but somebody who's committing suicide right now obviously not um and hopefully uh, i like to think that over the time we spent together um i changed his belief system but what was nice was he texted me um about a couple of months ago now two three months ago and he said i, I can i talk to you on the phone I said, yeah, absolutely he said he was driving over a bridge in Southampton, and it's a bridge, sadly, that has become synonymous with people jumping and committing suicide. And, and to the extent that there are emergency phone phones on there, I guess, like the Golden Gate Bridge in, in, in Frisco, it's kind of a, you know, um, and he said that he was driving, it was being driven over there, and he saw somebody about to jump. And uh, he said, pull over, got out of his car, and he went and sat with this, this guy. And pretty much taught him everything I had taught him over the, the, the months I'd seen him and talked this guy down and, and he ended up walking off the bridge, going down to a pub and, and spending the evening together. And I think they still in touch. But it, what a lovely story of that, that pay it forward that, that he was able to save his life and, and to, pay it, to kind of pay it forward like that. I just thought it was lovely. That is, that is, oh, that is it's, one of the loveliest stories. Wow, I, I had lots, yeah, lots of lovely. words at this moment. If you if you really picture it, like those guys sitting sitting there, and you you know, yeah. one of the favorite points of this interview was the for people who have grew up with bad parents or abusive parents, the idea that they see like a a loving mentor on the shoulders in times of adversities that supports them in a way, and in that yeah. point of situation for these two men that was maybe like a little version of you sitting on the shoulder like helping to structure the dialogue and that's like that, that's, that that's absolutely how he he told me it, it was like he said he, he heard everything i was saying and he, he's passing it on um to, to answer your question about uh i'll, I'll get on to the the tougher part now so one, one of the things that therapies i'm trained in that, that we do at our practice that not many people do is a therapy called hypnoanalysis and basically, I think in many ways, Freud did this without realizing it because he's a bit sat in a warm room, you know, on a couch, etc. And hypnoanalysis is about uncovering the, the, uh, the repressions, the unconscious things, the things we have no conscious awareness of. And I have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases of clients have come in who have taken through analysis. Uh, and it's quite a it's quite a challenging therapy of recalling a childhood experience that has profoundly impacted their life that they had no conscious awareness of when they came to see us. Yeah. And only when you, if you will make the unconscious conscious, can you truly change it. So, so, so those, those repressions. So we can only repress an experience up to about age fourteen. So um you know uh, the the young developing mind if something is so traumatic upsetting then the psyche will repress the experience but that that will always then cause a a symptom yeah. that symptom might be a particular fear of phobia yeah. uh, etc but it will always create a symptom so um there, there are so many to 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 mention um what i what i will say is that just one thing i think about often is a, a parent who uh brought their young child to see us and that child was only eating about five foods and i know a lot of kids it can be fussy eaters but this kid was meticulous over only eating those five foods and it wasn't until I sat with the kid and uh, uh, this this young child. It was a number of years ago now, so forgive me in my recollection of it. But at some stage, I remember, and there was no hypnosis, just chatting with this child. Um, 
I did do this thing called the blow away technique, which which is about the child visualizing um, uh, something that upset them and, and, and like blowing away balloons and stuff like that, going to the top of the mountain. And it, it's very therapeutic. It's wonderful for kids, this blow away method. And he said, uh, this kid said, he heard mum say to him, I love the little ones. I love the little, I love the little ones. You can almost hear the mum say this. And it reminded me because that child heard mum say that, I love the little ones. His little psyche then went, well, hold on. If I, I know, cause I've learned at school, if I eat food, I get big, but I know I need to eat a certain amount, of course, five a day. So what he did, he, he was almost unconsciously restricted his diet to prevent him growing because growing meant losing mum's love. Yeah. Does it make sense? It, it is. So, it's, so wow. Secondary payoffs. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it wasn't until he, he realized and mum realized that actually, again, the, the words we say, how powerful they are. Mum saying, I love the little ones had, had gone into his psyche, his belief system. Gosh, if I eat, I'm going to get big. If I get big, I lose mum's love. The the most important thing, love, nourishment, security. If you lose mum's love, or dad, you know, the, the the most significant fear you could have, isn't it, to lose to lose a parent's love? Yeah, have you that's... have you got any stories similar to that, Dan? That uh, not a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful one like you, one that end, ended quite tragically, but taught me about a similar matter. It's like I once had a had a person who showed up to my coaching who was he was a ketamine addict and he was uh, one of the most fascinating people I ever met beautiful a musician uh, also in a way yeah. but he got he got sidetracked by by some trauma and over the course of working together at the time I was trying to I was writing a couple of books about addictions and we kind of discovered that he was avoid like avoiding therapy and coaching and sticking to the modifications which we architected together because getting sober would mean that he would had to take care of his son he didn't want that yeah. like he wanted to preserve yeah, yeah, yeah. his freedom and that was for me like a moment where it's like uh, huh what a yeah. com complex house the human human being is and how often like our motivators are not aligned like you said in the beginning with our moving forward and i think that's a great question everybody should ask themselves occasionally it's like under whose whom's reign am i at the moment when i'm at my worst and do yeah. i have to need make, make some changes so it's like uh, that really taught me that like not all motivations have like the best of our interests in mind and we also have this in a way there's there's a quote I learned while writing the book that, that I wish I'd known 20 years ago. And it's from a, a, a brilliant book by Robert Trivers called Deceit and Self-Deception. And he, summar he summarizes the whole book in one, in one sentence. And I, again, I wish I knew this 20 years ago. We deceive ourselves in order to deceive others. Mm. We deceive ourselves in order to deceive others. And I think about this constantly because we are constantly, all of us, myself included, in this world of deceiving ourselves and telling ourselves a story so that we can convince the world of it. To the extent we forget it was a story, we forget we were deceiving ourselves. And I think what you've highlighted there it is it can be summarized in a nutshell and out isn't it lovely when you find something that's summarized so succinctly like yeah. that it's it's i'm launching for the behavior university a, a quote there a quote library on next week so we've got some technical problems with millions of quotes i'm utterly fascinated by orators of the past who could articulate wisdom of a lifetime within a couple of words like that's to me is yeah is it's magical and sometimes these words are you can't even take a single parable away from it and they survived the centuries and i have i'm very impressed by it in a way in regards to your private practice experience it's the hardest or 
maybe maybe when I, we warmed ourselves up the strangest most bizarre case you ever had i know you tried to be avoidant here but it's uh yeah, i got you i, I got you on yeah. the hot seat you, you've got me um gosh there's uh, so many i i've had people go into previous lives before in in analysis um i i put, i particularly don't believe that is the case uh i'm, I'm if somebody wants to leave that's absolutely fine i, I certainly don't but impose any belief system on somebody else but um and in those instances um i i believe the trauma happened in this life but actually this the the, the psyche has made it more palatable palatable to transfer it to another life um mm -hmm. it, it's it's it would be called cryptamnesia so so it, it's much more palatable to believe that let's say there was, there was an abuse or something like that 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 abuse happened in the 18th century i, I, I Think of one example. It was a lady and she was in a port, I believe it was in France or Spain, something like that. And, and suddenly she recalled in detail this going down this alley when there were some men that assaulted her there. Um, and again, we, we, we look for cognitive ease all the time. So we, as humans, we don't like cognitive dissonance and anything that resolves cognitive ease um i think makes it much easier which which is another subject well which is why i think vaping has increased so much in the uk or certainly probably probably in europe as well because it reduces cognitive dissonance if you're a smoker there is cognitive dissonance because you know it's harmful for you so then if you can transfer that to vaping we look for cognitive ease so therefore it, it brings down that cognitive dissonance and i realize i'm not answering your question there it's okay. Um, it's okay. The question, the question was the the strangest case you ever had, and then you started talking about people who went yeah. into former lives of them, and maybe you can pick up there what was that like and what you saw from it, because it's it's. Uh, I think as a as a trained hypnotherapist as well, you have gone deeper into the dark continent that is the psychology of a human being than most people on this earth. Yeah, so we would. I think there's value in exploring what the deepest points were for you personally and that you saw through the eyes of your clients? I, I think I, I have treated pedophiles um, who, who haven't offended but had the desire. And, well, firstly, were brave enough to come and seek help. Um, and I'll be honest, it's not something I, I could, uh, that was before I was a parent. I'm not sure I could to do that now, actually. But, um, but that, that's another, another topic. I remember one gentleman who had a compulsion to um, to to be with kids and had repressed a whole experience of a a, a trauma he had received as a child uh, for a, a very unpleasant experience and at the, at the moment at the moment of repression of that experience our minds store all the information it's a bit like time is slowed down so Often when I take somebody through analysis, they might sometimes say, I just keep seeing this wallpaper or hearing the sound or just, I don't know why, but I keep thinking of this, this, this sound, this smell, this color, I keep having this smell. And it will transpire that many sessions later, this particular experience might be a wallpaper they looked at while a unpleasant trauma was occurring or something like that. And that's locked in the psyche. And, and, and again, whenever we have a trauma like that, and it's repressed, there will be some manifestation of a, a, a phobia or, a, or some sort of uh, kind of revulsion, etc. But but on a positive note, the desire to, um, to do what he had previously had a compulsion to do went after he that that repressed experience was, if you will, relived and the, and, and the trauma released from that. Um, what do you know, think where, 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 where do where do you think come these what is what did you learn from this and it's where do you think come these compulsions from because it's i think one of the questions you are trained not to ask in university when you study psychology is where the fuck does that come from why we yeah we, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's that's always something that intrigued me but i have never Never I was in a room with somebody somebody like that. I was in a room with people who were on the other end many times, like who experienced experienced that. But it's could you elaborate a little bit on the psychology of that and just like from your point of view, 
why and 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 also how people can maybe as a follow-up step can visualize what it's like to have such a what it's like to walk around like that is it like having like a compulsion or like a monster within your head that occasionally possesses you is that this individual is totally like that what is your experience on that if you if i may ask you to elaborate yeah uh, i i'll answer not hopefully not flippantly but the example i use in my book about trauma i, I don't delve much into trauma in my book because i, I thought it was the wrong vehicle it, re it, it would you know requires several books etc but i talk about an experience i had as a child which is in the scheme of things a, a not not certainly not a trivial experience but but one that i guess makes sense to my clients um as a child here in southampton i remember we were taken to to go swimming for a couple of weeks at the local swimming baths and you know you, you're kind of threatened it's, it's cold it's not a nice experience and i remember afterwards we're in the changing rooms and i'm trying to get my swimming trunks off and I, I don't know if you've ever had the experience you know when you tie the knot and it gets wet it's very difficult to untie sometimes I think knots are much better these days, the, the fabrics. I couldn't get my shorts off. And the teacher was calling. And you know, it's like if you're, you, you've are you got to go somewhere, the teacher's getting angry, you're getting that pressure, and you know, you're feeling anxiety, you heat up. I'm trying to get my shorts off, and I just couldn't. And the teacher's calling everybody. You know, you can imagine the, as a child, not as an adult, but as a child, how unpleasant that experience is. So yeah. I ended up having to put my trousers over these wet trunks and then sitting in on the bus for a half an hour journey back to the school and it was an unpleasant experience and of course we we tend to remember the things that have an emotion attached to it so for example you know dan you probably remember the first time you kissed you know you, you, your first kiss yes do I you do, remember I your do. second I no. do. okay I, do. You know, I know it looked like i'm still waiting on it guys but it's I, I've, heard, <laughs> I've had my experiences when it, when it happens for you let us know yeah um, so we <laughs> make a podcast so we're, special we're, episode. We're, <laughs> i'm sorry okay so so when there's an, enough emotion attached to an experience to remember if you think if you think of your childhood chances are you'll only remember the experiences when there's an emotion attached to it yeah yeah you remember the first day at school you don't remember yeah. the second you remember the perhaps the first day at second secondary school you don't remember remember the second um you know you remember the first time you were intimate with a member of the opposite sex but maybe the second but probably not the third because we, we normalize things quickly so so our childhood the, the memories and experiences of our childhood tend to be when there's an emotion attached to an experience so going back to my experience of these wet trunks it was if you've ever sat in wet trunks as a kid it, it's not not a nice experience mm -hmm. so um many many years later whenever i felt on the spot like you know, um, say you're going to the theatre or the cinema and you don't have to go out to the toilet because, uh, you know, you don't want to get up in the theatre, basically, or, or, you know. And that, that, that feeling of anxiety would come over me. And I, I didn't know why for years, and I suddenly realised it was down to that experience as a kid when I couldn't get my wet trunks. And in the scheme of things, not, not a massive traumatic experience. Certainly not as an adult. As an adult, it would just be uncomfortable and, and, you know. But as a child, that, that, that had an impact that, that followed me for years and years and years. Welcome back, James. Hi. Hi there, Dan. Uh, this almost, almost sounds uh, like, a, like an Alex Jones podcast. But where were we? Pedophiles, right? <laughs> Like what we're, we're <laughs> we've we've we're, covered Hitler. We're on yeah. So um, um, the, let me, let me elaborate a little bit why I'm so interested in this. It's I feel like the dark aspects of psychology are often re like there's so much wisdom to 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 learn from that. And, and I think like there's almost like a prerogative for psychotherapists to not speak too much about it in a way. And I feel it's it's very interesting in a way. So if you would feel comfortable and share a little bit in regards to what you've learned and what your views were on that that would that would be very educative for the audience and for me personally I think. if not it's we can skip this topic no problem no it's you know i i think about a lovely lovely client i um saw recently um 
And he actually came because he had a, uh, a particular fear of driving on motorways. And, and you know, he was, he was a lovely guy, educated, very grounded. And I remember early on just asking him general questions and him saying, oh, no, it's, it's nothing to do with my childhood. And of course, we all know the Shakespeare expression, the lady doth protest too much, you know, it, it and it, that's not to mean it is always about childhood. I certainly don't mean that. But but when, when somebody says it isn't something, that's mm. the area at some stage you know you need to go to to find the answer. Mm-hmm. Again, going back to what I was saying a few a few uh, a few minutes ago, we deceive ourselves and kind of in order to deceive others. So the kind of the little flags you listen out for the things when they say no, it's definitely not that. I'm definitely not going to go there. I, it won't be anything to do with that. That's where that's where the answers are, and I think um, a lot a lot of therapy um, falls short because with certain conditions it doesn't deal with the the unconscious, and, and certainly no doesn't deal with any of the any repressed experiences, and. I, I think if, and I I'm certainly don't think I've got all the answers, I'm, I'm, I'm always learning, but uh, hypnoanalysis for me is, has been one of the best vehicles to allow people to resolve those unconscious anxieties. And I, I, you, you could sit with a therapist for years and talk about the conscious stuff, the stuff you think you're aware of, you, you are aware of, but actually it's the unconscious motivations are, are are the ones that are shaping our habits and who and who we are, uh, the ha- how how we feel, the the things that can um, cause us anxiety, etc. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, very or much. Began yeah, very, to... very much. It's it's. Can I share some thoughts with you? I just want to see if that's completely bullshit or if you've discovered something in a way. It's like one of the things that I found very from a psychoanalytical standpoint that I found helpful was Jung, Jungian notion, the idea or the Freudian notion, even that we consist of many parts. And it's yeah. that these parts uh, are like inhabitants in our house and that they can be yeah. bigger and smaller or make her sick in some degrees. And I'm wondering if, if you're of the opinion, if somebody experienced something utterly dreadful as a child, and where for that particular person actually made sense to groom a monster in their house that protects them in a way to some degree so that that part of the child becomes almost uncontainable to agree. Or do you feel it's people who engage in atrocities uh, do this by choice and are just born evil? Do you think evil is a condition that is, or maybe evil is a bad word, at least... There's extreme conditions. Do you think there is a pathway you take to arriving there? Or do you think it's, you were born with this thing in your house and other people just don't have it? Or do you feel it's like a, like an addiction where you start with something that is mildly inappropriate, just but you need an, a bigger fix. And eventually we are all in danger to arriving at horrible points if we don't feed the monster so to say that was like seven questions yeah. in a row but i just wanted to that was... <laughs> i think I, th- I think i know where you're coming from and, and dan that's such a such a great question um i i believe that well first of all uh, i think it's estimated something like five percent of us are potential sociopaths but we, do, we don't all go on to become serial killers i believe I, I, that if you grow grow up with love, nourishment, security, even even if in your DNA are propensities to harm others, etc., you're very unlikely to do so. But if your environment is, is hostile, there's trauma, then and you don't feel love and loved and valued, then actually you can become you can become a monster. Um, but I believe we are all born pretty much in kind of a 
a, a blank slate with with few exceptions and and i'm i'm not experienced enough to know what you know what percentage you know i've often thought you know and it's a question i've thought about if i went back and hitler was my son would he have grown up to do become who he, who he became um this is the best segment of my podcast over all the years by far I, i'm not sure how we <laughs> arrived here but it's it's you you rekindled my passion for these conversations okay con, con, yeah. continue please and, and sometimes i say to to our lovely clients when i when i meet someone you know if if i went back back in time and the day you were born you were given to me and i brought you home and you know gave you love nourishment love nourishment security and manage your belief systems and those people around you etc would you be here now with me and often they go no probably not which which implies it is the environment it, it's grow it's growing up and, and something that's key is with, with with regard to say a childhood trauma a childhood trauma is particularly bad if there's grooming and there's guilt in, in other words, if there is an isolated, horrible experience a child receives, and it's a one-off, um, receives as a one, but, but, but forgive me for the lack of my uh, lack of language on that. So an unpleasant, traumatic experience. If there's an experience, but there's been grooming by an individual, so say say it's a um, a sexual experience, and there's some grooming and that individual has made that child feel you you made me do this to you then there's guilt when there's guilt we repress the experience because it's overwhelming to that young developing psyche G guilt guilt is if you will the origin of so much trauma mm -hmm. Frankel said once, Has it? It's, it, it, it resonated with me, but it, there's, I think this is the point where we, we, we agree to disagree to some more, well, maybe, maybe not. Well, let's, let's find out. One of my favorite notions from Frankel in regards to this topic is between stimulus and response is a, it's a gap, there's choice. And it's, he saw many extreme forms of compulsive evil behaviors it's like one of the first experience he had in Auschwitz was like he had this this little manuscript of man's search for meaning that got him through the camps like there was there was this hope yeah. to finish this and one of his first experience was that they took it away from him and burned it just just out of like that for me is evil the idea of inflicting needless yeah. suffering and then in an artful manner upon another individual in a way and I don't think that the explanation that you can use here for this person had childhood trauma explains this behavior because it's there is still choice in it in a way. And it's or maybe this is yeah. something where I'm still trying to find my answer is because I certainly know that there are situations in life where when we are addicted, for example, that something is possessing us and acting through us and where we we just we just don't have any control over it in a way but it's in the extreme yeah. cases you described earlier where was the element of choice you noted and where you spoke with that particular individual in a way because i feel it's that's an important point in order to think about it, it is is it a disease or does it have an element of control over it or can we achieve it? It, you know it's 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 such a again such a great question we all we all tend to think if um, we were one of the guards at Auschwitz, um, and I understand, uh, if I remember right, they had Polish guards as well as the, the Germans. The couples, um, yeah, yeah, they had, they had, um, yeah. today, they, the, that was quite interesting for me. I'm, I'm currently learning a book, as I told you, and one of the exercises is, is called the couple. It's where yeah. people play a thought experiment in regards to figuring out who they were if they would be in this situation of a camp would they be the couple would they be the inmate would they be the guard in a way and make a psychological yeah, yeah. case of how they could arrive at each stations what their life would have been like and what the motivations would be that would 
allowed him to attack that role in a way. And it's it's yeah. Well, it, it it's it's like the Milgram experiment, isn't it? The yes. the uh, with electric shocks. You know, uh, most most people would say, no, no. If I was in that scenario situation, I wouldn't I wouldn't be that. I I would be, uh, you know, one of the kind guards, and I wouldn't do that. And things we don't know until we're in that situation. And I do sadly think that a lot of people would resort to the, you know, it, it, to, to quote Jung, their, their shadow, their worst parts of themselves, because we've seen it in experiments. You know, the, the, the classic Milgram experiment with the electric shocks. And uh, if anybody's, um, you know, you see, um, not come across that experiment, if they YouTube it or Google it, there's a brilliant film about it, the Stanford prison experiment, um, where the inmates are, are some are given the, the batons and the, the uniforms, etc. And again, there's another brilliant film about that. We we all tend to think, oh, no, no, I, I would never do it. I would never be one of those people. But because of this, this social anxiety, this peer pressure, many of us would. And something we haven't even touched on today is uh, social anxiety. You know, the, the, the roots of most of the problems we have, I see in the practice, self-esteem, social anxiety, and a locus of control. Again, self-esteem, social anxiety, and a locus of control. Um, and self-esteem, again, kind of misunderstood. And going back to something that we touched about earlier, confidence, I, I separate from self-esteem. Those are kind of two different things, but that's another topic for another day. Social anxiety is that fear of being judged on the spot, scrutinized, judged by others. Uh, that, that, that fear is hardwired within us. You know, our, our hunter-gatherer ancestors, uh, many, many, many thousands of uh, years ago, if we were extradited from our social group, that would almost spell death for us without, with, you know, with almost certainty. If we were you know, separate from our group, if we were an outcast, the likelihood of us surviving is is minimal. So so we have, even even though, we, you know, we are still those hunter-gatherer ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, the ways I often prove that is how often we see faces in things. You know, um, I've, I know I've gone off topic a bit, but how often okay. have we seen a, a, a face in a cup of coffee or in a cloud or, or in a tree? Yeah. Uh, and there's an example, a brilliant example I use in my book of an old photograph. Uh, if you get a chance to have a look at, I forget what chapter it is. There's this old photograph I had to buy, and you look at it, and it's actually a real genuine photograph of a couple. But the first thing you see is a, a massive head of Jesus in there. Before you actually see it was actually a, a baby, in the, you know, the way it's kind of, it, it's not doctored at all. That's how the photograph took. But we, we're hardwired to see faces everywhere. So that, that is a reminder of how little we have evolved. So similarly, this, this fear of being judged by others, this social anxiety is hardwired within us because out being outcasted meant almost certain death. So we have this, this fear of being judged and scrutinized by others, and it can limit us and it can force us to do things we don't want to do. May I add a, a challenging notion in this regard? Yeah. Are we not also, is there not also historical evidence that we are also as human beings hardwired to fear the judgment of our conscience? Because it's one of the things that I, that I am fascinated by, and there's not a lot of literature that people existed who went against the social norms to be without compromise in regards to abiding dictates of their conscience, even if it meant saving their own lives even in the book we talked about Frankel, like he talked of many cases where like he had this crazy friend he would sneak out of the barracks of, of to bring him food for example and he got caught later and got yeah, killed yeah it's like like and what do we do with those case studies where we have historic stories of socratic individuals who prefer to live in accordance with their highest beliefs and who stood against the crowd people like schindler or the person we just talked about or people even i heard a beautiful notion recently from 
out of all people, what's Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett says, my filter for choosing friends is I ask myself, is what that particular individual hide me? I thought it was, I thought it was so powerful in, in, in a way. And I feel it's the analysis that we are just, that survival is the only thing that is, is important to us. I'm not sure that this encapsulates who we are. I feel there's, there's yeah. that's, that, that's, there's something, something missing there that's also can be used as an excuse. And the Germans use it as an excuse in the Nuremberg processes, right? We got orders. Yeah. They didn't want to add the crown. Yeah, yeah. We kind of came as a consensus as a species that this is no excuse, that there's something above that in a way. And I wonder, wondering if when you were working with these extreme compulsory cases, if what that conversation was like, did they, did you give them a victim's mentality or did they give them to themselves? Or did you discover uh, crossroads where they say, I could have acted differently, but didn't? The, the compulsion exceeds their self-loathing. I feel like I need to think a year about what you just said. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> can you, you say know, that again? Um, <laughs> their, their, their compulsion to do something exceeds their self-loathing the self-loathing the guilt comes later but the compulsion is there is there first and again i believe driven driven motivated by childhood trauma but if, if you come from the standpoint that we we all myself included has some type of personality disorder um I got, I got many. <laughs> one <laughs> you should meet me you know, more, my friend <laughs> <laughs> not not you Dan but the, the rest of the population you're fine okay but for example uh you know we touched briefly on narcissism earlier on uh and narcissism is a spectrum disorder so you know you could be a covert narcissist and very charming endearing to others or or and and, and an overt narcissist more uh it, it's more out there so to speak but it's still a spectrum disorder and if you imagine zero out of 10, it is incredibly unlikely that we would have a client, A, that even comes through our door, it's above a three. And the ones that are, you know, between one and three are gonna be a lot harder to work with because of their, their, their belief system. And, you know, they are right, the world is wrong. So you, if you get enough people together, you could, amplify the worst parts of themselves again as Jung said their shadow and and they can be driven through um through social anxiety through through peer pressure through c combined belief systems I mean in many ways what's happening in the world right now is is because we are pack animals because we're, we're that herd mentality groups are buying into other people's belief systems. And, and, and going back to the question that you didn't answer, uh, again, my thought about taking people with a belief system, the earth is flat into outer space, what percentage would change their belief? I believe if there was 100 people, maybe two people might change the beliefs. Why? Because people need to believe. We look for stuff to support what we believe. And, and so if you get um, a, a cult, that is a group of people who uh, need to believe. And I don't know if you've ever read um, the uh, the brilliant work by um, Leo Fastinger about cognitive dissonance and his study of the uh, group called the Seekers. Who um, do, do you know the story of the? Dorothy Martin and, and, and a cult called the Seekers in America. It's about, I think it's about 1950s, somewhere in uh, North America, Chicago. Where Could you share the story the, very quickly? Yeah, yeah. So, so this this group of individuals were told that the Earth was going to end. There's going to be floods everywhere, and that there was this group of beings we're going to come and rescue this group and Dorothy Martin and, and in this group were, were doctors and surgeons and you know it wasn't just random people there were people who if you will should should have known better uh, but she convinced this group that the world was going to end and um this group was infiltrated by, by Leo Fastinger who, who wrote the brilliant book 
um, the name escapes me, I'll come to him in a second, ab about this cult, the Seekers, and about Dorothy Martin, uh, who was later convicted. Anyway, so she said on this, it was Christmas Eve, the, the, the aliens, the, these otherworldly buildings were going to come and rescue this cult. And the, the newspaper crews and the cameras were there. And it's about the 1950s. And of course, Christmas Eve came, this group of believers were there, no spaceship came. Now, if you were one of the, that, that group member, you, you'd sold everything, you'd given stuff away, you'd sold your house, your car, everything to be in this, this cult, this group. You suddenly cannot not then believe, oh, I've made a mistake. In other words, you are sold into it so much you need to believe. And I think she then came up with one of the, the, the greatest kind of answers in history. It was kind of pure genius. She, she disappeared for a while because people were saying, well, look, we, we were going to be rescued. The earth was going to be destroyed. We're going to be rescued. And she came back and she said, I've spoken to, to the gods, to the, these otherworldly beings from another planet. And they're so impressed with your loyalty, they're going to save the earth. Now, as a member of the Seekers, as, as this cult, you suddenly go, ah, I've done a great thing. I've given up everything and I've, I've saved the world. So that reduces your cognitive dissonance. We look for cognitive ease all the time. Cognitive dissonance makes us feel anxious, makes us feel um, something's not right. So, um, and I realize I've gone so far off, off your question now, as I've done many times before. Uh, no, I know, I, I, love, I loved it so far. And it's like, don't think of my questions as intentional. They come from a place of curiosity, not to guide this conversation in a manipulative manner. It's like, I don't know what I want to do with those questions most of the time anyway, so please just can you talk no, about games to your mind. They're, 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 su they're such great questions. So, What can we learn from, again, these, from this story? What, what would you say? Well, if, if, and there are many books written about it. If you want to create a cult, there are certain formula you need to follow. Please, please the next question, how to create a cult. <laughs> I was I mean, waiting. I, mean, I was waiting for answering, <laughs> getting some an expert, not for myself. A friend asked me this many times. A, a, wants... a, a friend wants to start a religion. Yes. Um, uh, how to start a cult? It, how do we do this? Yeah, you know, it, it, you've got to get people with enough um, belief, and you've got to use a form of hypnosis, and. You, you know, you get the right people who are highly suggestible um, and and in a way you use Ku's law. I don't know if you ever come across Ku's law, but Ku's law is also the law of re reverse effort. When you, when you say to somebody, try not to think of something, try, try not to think of a pink zebra, Dan. Try not, try not to think of a pink zebra, okay? Of course, you're thinking of a pink zebra. Of, of a course. pink zebra right so, now, yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be the pink zebra podcast. <laughs> so whenever you say to somebody, try not to think of something, you're, you're uh, so, so very brief. Emile Kuh was a, a French um, psychologist, author, wrote a brilliant book about 101 years ago. Uh, um, and Emile Kuh, and if there's somebody French listening, they'll know I'm pronouncing the name wrong. Kuh, eh, Kuh. Uh, Emile Kuh came, no, wrote about the law of reverse effort, also known as Kuh's law. And whenever you try not to think of something, you tend to think of it 20 times more and in many ways you can you can almost utilize Ku's law so so for example try try not to think about buying my book right now okay whatever you do try not to think about buying my book whatever you do put that out everybody mind, everybody who listens don't it. think about buying <laughs> buying his book after this podcast i forbid you think about this I will not put the show 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 it to the book in don't click it <laughs> okay <laughs> So, so it, you know, you get enough people, enough belief at the right times, lower their cognitive dissonance, use auto suggestion, um, and that's that's kind of going off on another another tangent. There, there, there's there's a there's a rule by a, a gentleman with a fantastic name. There's a, a hypnosis rule. I think his name was Hippolyte Bernheim, something like that. Hippolyte, brilliant name. He said there has to be an intensity of idea, a, a an emotion and no counter suggestion from the psyche. In other words, if you have a strong enough emotion, going back to our conversation about Hitler, you have a strong enough emotion, an intensity of idea, 
and no counter suggestion from the psyche, then that suggestion will take root in the subconscious mind and it will just become part of who you are. You know, when I've helped hundreds and hundreds of people stop smoking using hypnosis, but mainly transferring, as we spoke about previously, once you shift somebody's belief system, and then at the end of the session, I will do hypnosis. But by the time I've got to the hypnosis, they're, they're already a non-smoker. But intensity of idea, no count, no, a, an emotion, doesn't matter what the emotion is, and no count suggestion from the psyche. If you look at Hitler talking, um, even if you look at Donald Trump in many ways, you know, this, the, the, the body language, that is suggestion. We are all suggestible. And that suggestion takes root in the subconscious mind. And if you think of a child, they are taking on suggestions all the time. I said right back at the beginning of the podcast when we're, when we're talking about when I'm in a, uh, a, a toy shop and I'm with my son and I'm listening to what other parents are saying to their kids. Money doesn't grow on trees. We're not made of money. You don't deserve that. You haven't been good enough to that. For, to deserve that toy um you know people don't like us can't afford things like that money is the root of all evil mm -hmm. those are suggestions and they take root in the subconscious mind mm -hmm. and then they become part of who you are so a, lo a long very long convoluted way of saying it if you get the right people at the right time give them enough suggestion you could get them to do just about anything and with the uh, the foot in the door technique. Have you ever read um, the book Influence, um, Cialdini's book Influence? He talks about the foot in the door technique. There's, yes. a, there's a brilliant example, you know, you know of, of you go to somebody's house and you ask them, could you put a big sign in the front of your house asking people to slow down? 99 times that, people say no. But if you say, oh, can I put a little sticker or a little, little flag in the thing that says slow down? People say yes. If you then go back to that person, uh, a month or two later, oh, do you mind if I put that? People are more likely to say yes. And, and all that's happened in those instances are you get enough people in a hypnotic state, mm -hmm. foot in the door technique, um, you, you can you can convince oh, yeah. anybody, you know, it's, it, maybe it's an experiment that you and I could do sometime to get enough people convinced, but, <laughs> you know, I join your cult, Dan. Yeah. What, was, what are the I perks was, for the... <laughs> I love that we are thinking the same 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 thing. No, it's 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 actually the foot in the door technique. It's I never noticed that like since since you just spoke that it's that's a great book. Like I thought a lot about like as you mentioned as you discovered in this call is how people arrive at different characterological points and in the extremes and um I don't know why, but I like to look at the extremes in both ways. I'm interested in how the most outstanding individuals ever created themselves or were created, but also what are the commonalities of the the worst ones, so to say. And there's a great book in, called Ordinary Man that depicts Jordan Peterson recommends it quite often. Yeah. It depicts the journey from uh, Nazi soldiers from normal recruitments to the end of them shooting naked women in the naked pregnant woman in the forest and one of the things that they mention in the book is, is that they don't start with that. It's a progression. Yeah. They start with doing something small. That's something also I noticed, for example, from communistic regimes or any form of totalitarian. They don't, you don't start by telling somebody you're going to kill your neighbor. You start by asking them for a little favor that is bending their conscience a little bit to get them a little bit off the, off the line. And from there... They become more and more invested yeah. and less and less capable to resist whatever comes from the outside. Have you noticed some something similar? Does that make sense in a way? Well, you, you, what you're saying it kind of reminds me. I, I, I love historical stories. I think we can learn a lot from them. Um, and one of my favorite books is uh, Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power. I love Robert Greene. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it, 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 it's quite... A, <laughs> I, I, I listen to it as an audio book, and um, it, it's quite hard going. It's, he's he's a brilliant writer. It's quite hard going. But every now and then, there's a little nugget in there. And um, one, of, one of the stories that I think about quite often is a brilliant, brilliant story. Uh, and forgive me if I get this wrong. Uh, I think it was 
it was to do with potatoes. It was Frederick the Gr Frederick the Great. Forget, again, forgive me if I'm wrong. So I think it was in Prussia. Again, forgive me if I've got the history wrong on this. And there was a problem. There wasn't enough food. So at that time, a potato was, was seen as the food you'd give a dog. It wasn't a, an edible food. It, it wasn't for human consumption. So we had this brilliant idea of making the potato the, the royal food and having his um, staff, his gardeners, plant loads of them in the fields around the, the palace and made sure there was guards everywhere and put up this royal proclamation that, the, 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 you know this story, that the, uh, the, the potatoes are now the royal food. And of course, again, going back to what we are saying a few minutes ago, Coup's Law, you try not to think of the potatoes. Now, all people can think about potatoes. So he said to the guards, I went to guard it, but not, not too effectively. So of course, naturally, the, the, um, the peasants, the people um, would go in at certain times to steal these potatoes potatoes and it, it, they became a mainstay popular food and and i understand to this day even in in latvia and those regions around there potato is there are more potatoes eaten in that whole region around there so in many ways it encapsulates everything it encapsulates coups law trying not to think of something it encapsulates if you deny something that's what you want more um, <laughs> yeah, it's, um that's why that's when you got me laughing it's like the idea of how we use like scarcity called to, to increase yeah the, the value of it I, I i love that so much um if we would write uh james hall's laws of money what would they be the first three of them what was something because i feel the outcomes we produce and our lives are closely connected to our psychology, our behaviors in a way. And I would be curious, like before you, or if you would have advice for somebody who wants to become financially wealthy, what would you, what would Gosh. that conversation be like? I, I would say a couple of things actually. Uh, and I'm not saying I necessarily follow this advice myself and it's, it's stuff I've learned later in life I, I, I'm going to go off the tangent ever so slightly if that's okay and I think of course, of course, often, of course. I often think of uh, you mentioned Warren Buffett uh, a couple of um, a couple of questions ago and I remember him seeing sat with a group of students and him saying to the students that tomorrow you're going to have a brand new car arrive outside your house and you can have whatever car you choose, whatever cost, whatever, fully spec'd up, whatever car you want. But it's the only car you're ever going to have. And then these students are, first of all, you can imagine, they go, oh, amazing. And they think, oh, gosh. And he says, how, how, how much are you going to look after that car if that's the only car you've got for the rest of your life? And he said, that's how you should think about your body. In other words, never, never sacrifice your health for money. Yeah, health, that's... You, you know, where, right now, anybody listening to this podcast, 20 years from now, there were, anybody listening, would probably very few exceptions, would, would give any amount of money to be right back now, here today with the health they have, how they feel, unless they're having a particularly bad day, of course, with, with how they feel, how healthy they are, you would give any amount of money to do so. And, and, and I remember a lovely smoker I had um, a year or two now, a, a gentleman uh, came to stop smoking. He was probably in his late 70s and very, very wealthy. I had grandchildren. He loved, loved, loved these grandchildren. And I remember him saying to him, what would you give for another month to be with your grandkids? All the, all the years you've earned money, what would you give to be right now, to, to, to have another, imagine it's your end of your life and you can buy a month back or a, or a period of time back. He said, I'd give everything I own. Hmm. So to, to deviating lots as I've done, health is the most important thing. 
and something we haven't even touched on today you know i've got my own health worries i'm working on yeah. and i wanted to um, ask if it, it could be okay to pivot pivot there because i feel it's yeah you really really spoke to me it's like one of the things that i would like to learn more is about you know you have these ideas in regards to what you feel you should know but it's it's often <laughs> only limited to the to the problems you think you have it's like if you talk <laughs> with with the future self or with a friend who's down the journey it's you haven't even conceptualized the biggest problems of your challenge and sometimes on the outside you don't get the answer you want but the answer you need to have and that's one of the things that i feel yeah. mentorship is is just superior to all forms of education in a way but i feel as a yeah. young guy i'm i'm i don't know i'm a two meter tall vital guy like i i feel invincible i i smoke cigars and eat brownies like there's no tomorrow it's i do my exercise regime but i i i just feel like my body will preserve forever and i feel now a conversation so earlier you mentioned that there was a shift in your health journey could you tell the story behind that and because i feel disease is also yeah. a te teacher if it may maybe you agree with me you know but it's like limitations are yeah, often I absolutely yeah sparks of wisdom in a way yeah 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 um it to be honest firstly it's not something i talk about a lot i certainly don't talk about it a lot with um uh close friends i, I will do but there, there are people i know that do not know i, I have a neurological condition I, i was diagnosed with ms 12 years ago and um and I, I'm somebody who's already all, always looked up, I've considered looked after myself. I've eaten well. I've, uh, I've never smoked, never, uh, never, never drunk alcohol. Um, certainly, certainly not to excess. It's a genetic thing. I don't, none of my family can drink much alcohol. We just kind of makes us feel poorly. Um, and I was one day woke, um, woke up and the left side of my body was numb. And I, I, I couldn't work out why I had this kind of numb feeling down. Anyway, cut a longish story short. I, I had lots of tests, a lumbar punch, and I was diagnosed with MS. And I was given a, a prognosis that I'd probably be in a wheelchair in a couple of years. And I said to myself, that's unacceptable. So from that moment onwards, I focused on getting well again. And I, I do whatever it takes to get to get well. My first major episode was about five or six years ago, and my left leg is not—I can't run anymore, but I can I can still kind of walk a fair, fair distance. Um, but my biggest episode was last summer after a um, a, a stressful divorce to a, to a narcissist, and. The, the stress of that caused another episode and it was a, a horrendous summer for me and it, anybody who's ever experienced brain fog because it was a, in the uk it was a hot summer um it, it was the worst i'd ever experienced just just getting through each day uh and looking after my son and every every day was a struggle And the thing is, what I've come to realize is that we we do things more for other people than ourselves. So I started to have uh, cold exposure. So in, in my garage out there, I've got a, an ice bath. I I uh, have more recently gone on to a, a heavily plant-based diet. Um, I, do, I do whatever it can. I, I'm having hyperbaric oxygen therapy as well at present. I don't care. I will do whatever I can to be well again, because you realize when you lose health that nothing else matters. If somebody said, here's, here's 10 million pounds, but you've got poor health, or you can have great health and no money, I would go for the option of good health. Because it's not until you lose it, you realize how important it is. And again, it, you know, it feels very unfair sometimes. I, I If uh, if anybody's had or knows about hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you're basically in this chamber. It's quite claustrophobic. I have an oxygen mask on. I have an hour, hour and a half, three times a week, and I come out of this this kind of experience. I had one this morning. Your head's buzzing a bit, and 
you feel a bit kind of woozy for a while. And I, I walk through the town and there are people there with cigarettes and the, the, the beer bottles. And I'm thinking that there's part of me feels an unfairness. But then going back to what you said, there's also this, what lesson can I learn from this? And the, the lesson I've learned, and they're powerful lessons, is, again, to manage your thinking. I don't allow myself to believe I will never be fully well again. In fact, the only, the only times I come close to that are when I have hospital appointments. And it's such a negative experience. I can find, find myself sinking for a few days into almost depression because I'm pretty much told I'm fucked. I had, a, I had a phone call three months ago with a neurologist who advised me to go on to this medicine injection that is so strong it shuts down your immune system. And I, I just thought, no. No, I, I will do whatever it takes. I will investigate. And I know you're big into, um, I know you said you spent uh, over 100,000 um, on uh, biohacking and, and, and hacking, you know. If somebody said, look, cold exposure every day, fasting, um, e eating well, doing this and all that, I, I don't care, I will do it. And I think a lot of it is down to that locus of control. If you feel in control, then you can bring about change in your life. And it's very, it can be very easy to, to feel like you've lost control because in many ways, the, the, the health system in the UK uh, is brilliant, but it's, it's almost, it's not a health system, it's a sickness system, if that makes make some sort of sense. Um, so I will do wherever it takes to get well, but the one thing I haven't touched on, it really forces me to manage my thinking well, mm -hmm. to challenge my belief system and that, you know, to quote, to quote the film, um, Apollo 13, uh, when, uh, I think it's, uh, Ed Krantz says failure isn't an option. For me, failure isn't an option. I have to get fully well again to enjoy life and to fully enjoy my son, to be able to play football with him, to run around, um, to play. He, he, he is my greatest motivator to get well again. And for him, I will sit in an ice bath that is painfully uncomfortable. Um, I will have hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, I will do whatever it takes. And and I, I hopefully help others to. So so you said you know disease is a great teacher, yes, yes. It, it's taught me to to manage my own thinking, to stay hopefully stay grounded, um, and and to help others. Um, and when you're in a, a place you don't want to be, health wise you will do whatever you can to get out of it and to feel well again. And I've been in those places and I never want to be there again. And it's not, not till you've experienced it. Can anybody understand it? I guess it's like bereavement. If you've never had a bereavement, you can't describe to somebody what it's like uh, to lose somebody when you've lost your health and you feel you haven't got, got enough cognitive power to drive somewhere or to do something or the physicality to go for a long enough walk uh, or even walk around to, to the park. Uh, you'll do wherever you can to, to, to get it, to get it back. And unfortunately, probably in another 20, 30 years, there will be cures. There will be, the, you know, the, the field will be different, but, um, and I guess in some ways I feel like a bit of a pioneer at, at, at no stage when I go to see any of the, the MS team at the hospital, does anybody say, well, have you ever thought about cold exposure or fasting? Have you ever thought about hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Have you ever thought about uh, supplementing with vitamin D? To, you know, um, and I don't know if any of these are working, but, but what I do know is they, they give you a feeling of being in control. Yeah. Does yeah. that make some sort of sense? Is that, I can't even remember what the question was now, Dan. But <laughs> no, it's we we were we were there was a pow powerful notion that you gifted me. It reminds me of the quote from Churchill. I think it was a Churchill. He said, "Like what matters most is how well we walk through fire," and I feel like it's. Uh, 
I am very inspired by people who transform adversity into stories of human human triumph and I think there is just like a glass ceiling to how good a person can become until they are truly tested and the biggest tests are they don't happen in the office usually they they are suffering they yeah, are like yeah. the disease death abandonment what whatever it's the the things that humanity has always um battled battled with um one of the can, things that can inspired... i ask you a question oh. yeah sure well yeah you, you were one of the most insightful um people i've ever had the pleasure of talking to certainly to do a podcast with you you, you got some brilliant brilliant questions uh, really got really got me thinking um and i know you've got this passion to understand yourself and and um maybe on another occasion i, I can ask i'd love to take time to ask you questions about your journey and i i kind of get the feeling you've experienced a lot of hardship trauma in, in, in your own life up to now what what one thing have you learned about yourself that you'd like to teach others and what thing do you what thing would you like to know about yourself and your motivations that you don't know yet if that makes any sense but the first question i really don't feel in a position yet to give a sophisticated answer part of my identity is i see myself as a nomadic schooler who is in training so to say, who travels around the world and meets great teachers such as I am today in order to progress on his own journey forwards. But it's in regards to the second question is uh, I really haven't discovered my limits, which is quite scary for me. It's like I have a strange motor. I don't tire. I am infatigable in many endeavors of, of, of my life. And I think that's something I <laughs> not hoping to find out, but it's that is maybe like my question that I'm trying to solve with all my ventures is how far can we go as an individual mm -hmm. and as, as, as a species. And one of the reasons why I want to contribute so many educational inventions to the people I'm connected with is because I, I, I am curious, like, where's, where's the limit for you guys, for us. And I hope that I can, I can stretch there's what is possible for an, for an individual. Uh, that, I, that I love that. Your, your, I love your curiosity, um, and that generally comes across how interested you are in stories and people in, in their journey, uh, and how we can all learn from from each other. Mm. Um, and that that your your univer the Haven University is just a phenomenal resource for people. There's so much compacted into there. Uh, I don't know how old you are, Dan, but um, thirty-four. Just, just how thirty-four? Yeah, it's just, just incredible what you've, what you and your team have done. So, and, and I, I'm kind of grateful that I've got access to it as well, because like you, I'm, I'm, you know, always learning. Yeah. Uh, yeah, James, we are back after some mild difficulties where you were, you <laughs> were giving, giving me some praise, and I was uh, giving the most awkward answer. Ever. I hope that we can now focus the shift again and on you. Um, in the last part of this interview, I would like to quickly learn about what you're working on right now and how people in the future can support you in your many endeavors. Oh, that's really kind. Um, I, several things I'm working on at present. Uh, well, working on trying to be the best dad I can, can be, which which to any any parent out there, that, that's pretty much a full time job. Um, I am hoping to start a new book within the next few months, and I have a title for the book. It, I guess it's a bit clickbaity. I bought the domain name, uh, uh, and it funny it, it, it came. To, I was on a holiday on, in Antigua, and. Um, I was sat there and I watched this gentleman and he had clearly had come from some uh, chemotherapy or some awful cancer treatment that he needed. And he, he walked past me and he stood. It was the most beautiful setting. 
overlooking uh, the sea and the greenery. It's just a beautiful place in Timor. And he stood there smoking. And again, it just fascinated me that the, 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 for his compulsion to be smoking in such a beautiful environment. And yet he clearly just finished some uh, awful uh, treatment for cancer. And I found that later he, he had had this uh, treatment. And it made, made me wonder why, why we do these things. And uh, the title of the book is going to be called, and, and forgive me, you said I can swear, it's going to be called, What the Fuck Were You Thinking? So, um, although it will be F star, star, star. Um, because it has a, the meaning is, it's something you could ask somebody else, but something you can ask yourself. You know, we all go, we, we all say to somebody, you know, what, what the fuck were you thinking? Or you say to yourself, what the fuck were you thinking? Mm. And, and it, it it's also touches on um, a thing called the illusory superiority cognitive bias, which is a hell of a mouthful, where, where we've, we've created so much self-deception, we're actually... Um, again, going back to what we were saying earlier about the Robert Tribbers book, brilliant Robert Tribbers, which is Deceit and Self-Deception. I'm kind of waffling here, but it, it's about self-deception. Mm -hmm. How we deceive ourselves to believe things and how we um, do that in order to deceive others, if you were in a nutshell. It's still in its early kind of form. But what I found with my first book was I, I knew the journey, but but as I was writing it, um, I um, the journey became clearer, yeah, so to speak. And I, and I know I, I saw an interview with um, James Clear, who's who's wrote the brilliant book um, Atomic Habits, and he, and he says he had, he knew kind of roughly the journey, but it wasn't until he started writing the book did that kind of path. Oh yeah, that, that makes sense now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I'm working on that. Uh, trying to find time to write music, um, trying to find time to to listen and watch to some of your brilliant podcasts because just scrolling through them last night, I think, oh, yeah, I want to set time aside for that. I, I've got a fascination also in body language and in behavioral science as well of late. So I'd almost, I think, like to set up a behavioral science lab so that we, you know, we can look at hu human behavior and why we do what we do. But, um, and maybe maybe in the sometime in the future we can work together on something i know we've spoken about um brain stuff to help people with their habits and i know you've got that app yeah. coming out soon but um yeah but that's yeah, like, that's, 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 that's for another thing yeah that's that's beautiful idea with the book it's it's um we talked a lot about choices today also i feel and how in the life of an individual ultimately the quality of it is dictated by the quality of choices we make also something James Clear talked about and I feel like your your book that is coming out is in great need because one of the things that I found that all bad habits have in common is an element of deceit that you mentioned now that yeah. way is you are pretty much looking for the right thing in the wrong place but you know it but you take the substitute because you're not strong enough to wait or endure the discomfort to, to some degree in yeah. a way and I feel like the strongest individuals I met in my life were the ones who could face the truth the longest, if that make any yes. sense in, in a way. So I think like your book is bitterly needed. I'm looking forward to read it and have another 17-hour uh, interview like we had one today. <laughs> um, the truth was free. Yeah. Last question, and then I then I promise we I will be more respectful of your time and cut this off. We talked about health. But I feel health is connected to death to some degree in a way. And what is some messages you would try to preserve if, God forbid, like you never know, like this would be one of the last media appearances you had because something would happen. What do you want to preserve if this would be the only opportunity for it? In terms of for my son or... You can address, this. think of this, like, I think there was a, the question, it was addressed to Bertrand Russell. I really liked it. He was once asked, like, in an interview, if this interview snippet would be put in a time capsule, 
and survive the centuries. What kind of um, message would you put into the capsule? Or in this case, like maybe if something would happen to you anyway. Yeah, uh, I um, there's a, there's actually a, a service uh, a thing called um, a company called Kilu, and Kilu um, pretty much um, have a service and an app where you can um, store messages for other people. And should should you depart, then your loved ones have access to like your bank accounts, and and so you haven't got to hunt around for, for those. Um, and I've actually started to book messages together for my son just for that. Really? And I, I, I love your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I, I I write music for him so that in many years, because I, I think when, if you're as a composer uh, as well, your true self comes out through your music. And he would listen to Lewis, and when he was older, and go, "Oh yeah, I kind of I get my dad. I understand why, um, who he was it, through his through his music, so to speak." Um, I would say to him, and, and want to be thought of as somebody who was honest, reliable, um, spoke the truth, set their own path. Didn't, didn't follow others if they believed that was the, the, the truth. Um, helped as many people as with honesty and integrity as, as I could. Um, and overcame adversity. Mm. And if I could teach him anything, it would be that that locus of control to realize how much control he has in his life because i think we live in a world now where people feel out of control so they look look to others and, and it's almost touching all everything we've spoken about up to now they look to others for that that leadership and if that leadership isn't good which in many cases it isn't then they're going to go down the wrong path but if you are a an outlier you can take a step back and go this doesn't seem right or that does seem right uh, to, to not to not buy into fate luck, fate, luck and chance too much. And, and indeed, there's a whole chapter in my book about it. What something we have been touched about today, but something I've observed with the clients. Clients who believe in if your magical, mystical, external beliefs, fate, luck and chance, that everything's predetermined, tend to feel powerless and not to be able to bring about any change in their own life. Mm. And, and clients who've never gotten better if you will for one of a better expression through therapy are the ones that that, that kind of don't let go to that and need, need that kind of to belief in, in magical mystical things outside of themselves because then it's hard to bring about change in your own life so if i can teach them anything it's a, it's having a growth mindset um to ha to have a internal locus of control to have high self-worth to have resilience, which sadly nowadays um, is a word that's overused, I think, in education, but actually we aren't really developing true resilience. Um, and to, to see the world, uh, indeed the world, the universe, as Einstein said, as we touched upon several hours ago, as friendly. Because I believe, I believe the majority of people are good people and are friendly. Mm -hmm. And if you see the world like that, the world will respond to you like that. Again, uh, Marshall McLuhan said, I'll see it when I believe it. And he, I knew the name would come back to me. That brilliant quote, I'll see it when I believe it. We see the world based through our belief systems. And if you see those belief systems, if you see the world as, as friendly, if you see the world as, as actually a good place with good people, that is what you will not necessarily attract, because that, that sounds like the law of attraction or something like that, no. But that that is what, what how you process, how you see the world, as we said earlier, we, you and I, my friend, we see the world similarly, but still different. Yeah. Um, that That's how the world will respond to you. And if I can leave the world uh, having left it with, with something that helps other people, um, then, a better place, and it sounds a bit cliched, then 
I think if we all aim for that honesty and integrity, then enough people do that, the world will be the place it, I, I believe the world could be an incredible place. We're not there now, right now, sadly. Um, and you have a warning for my generation. I believe. I feel like sometimes when I when I studied the old stories of the past, I was one of the things that sparked me is that the our wise ancestors were not only giving advice and in regards to how we live, but they also trying to warn us to not make the same mistakes they did. If you would add like a little yeah. little red notion into the capsule, what would be the yeah. the content of it? I, uh, well, without sounding too cliched, uh, uh, and I generally mean it's we need more people like you, Dan. Well, enough people like you will would change the world, but unfortunately, you're in the minority. I, I would say yes, it's such a great question. Don't believe the belief systems of other people. Question, question your own beliefs. Challenge, challenge your own beliefs. Go back to what I said, my Alfred method. Always look for redundant beliefs. Is this true what I'm thinking? Is this based on any reality? Is this, you know, this herd mentality, this, this pack mentality that, that we have? And we haven't even touched on the, the reason we have this is because our brain capacity is so overwhelmed. You know, I, I read a thing, it was like the equivalent to one of the uh, one terabyte thumb drives you get. I don't know how true that is. But, but the reason we have these, the reason we buy into beliefs so readily and so easily is because we don't have the cognitive power, processing power to be thinking all the time, is this factual, is this real? So it's, it's easier for us to go, actually, well, enough people think that, I'll think it too. Love it. And, and, you know, if you've ever read any of the Dan Daniel Kahneman's brilliant uh, thinking fast and slow, too much slow thinking, not enough fast thinking, or a system to thinking. Um, question your thinking all the time. Don't buy into the beliefs of others because enough people buy into it. You know, it's, I don't know, somebody like the Kardashians, for example, I'm not, I don't know much about them, but I do know, you know, millions and millions and millions of followers. And yet somebody might get a Nobel Prize for creating some, some cure for cancer, and yet we've probably never heard of them. Mm -hmm. You know, question your beliefs. I that's hope that answers your question. That's a, that's a power, powerful notion, and it's it stands in congruence with one of my great a philosopher who really moved me, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who said that it takes only one person to bring down a tyranny by standing up to a lie. And it's like, like even though it was a play, for example, with the with the prominent people you just mentioned, I feel that's that's a great ethos to integrate into our character is to not buy into the belief systems of the crowd, but to consult our own conscience, or as you mentioned beautifully, our Alfred on our shoulder. On that regard. I would like to express my my deepest uh, gratitude that you took so much time out of your busy schedule to uh, illuminate me, and I hope people will find this interview useful. Share with us quickly so. how how they can find you, how they can uh, follow you on your channel. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, our our main main website for, for our practice is we are the Hampshire Hypnotherapy and Counseling Centre abbreviated to hansip.co.uk or you could put my name jameshomes.co.uk or take, take you to our website um sadly we have other people who've copied our name and all that but i guess it's the highest form of compliment is when when people try to copy you uh and to, and, and kind of feed off your your good um your good uh, reviews and reputation um make sure you 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 get up you find us don't worry uh, i put i don't oh. put the link of the competitions in this this article so guys <laughs> it's, don't worry there will be only one link to the real page james thank you so much for taking the time let's do this another time for now thank you for appearing yes. on this show okay lovely questions dan thank you so much been a great thank you everybody for listening for fighting through this uh, three hour long interview give me feedback in the comments in regards to if you enjoy this long format content i find this to be um, the most fruitful way to share 
great experts with you and i hope that you will tune in next time thank you so much for showing up